Oh, sweet. You stayed a moderator on there. Praise God for that. Let's go. What's up, sisters in the house? I don't know where to put this. Praise God. What's up, brother? I need the double glasses already. I can't see a thing. What's up, Zerub? Zerubbabel. What's up, peeps? What's up? Amen. Praise God. Let's go. Tony Stewart in the house. Double glasses means business, and I can see. Praise God. Yeah, I had to start with double glasses. The vision's getting worse. Amen. God bless you. Dog's barking already. Let me let her in and we might have peace for an hour. Let's go, you animal. Oh, I'm going to work on a live station next time after this live. What's up, sister? Exhausted as usual. <laughs> the typical. Amen. Look, I didn't even see a notification button on here, so it, it must just do it automatically. I don't know. Amen. Salvation zone. I see a lot of you guys in the comment section. I can remember some of them. What's up, Brother Bry? I have a funny to tell cool cat. <laughs> Amen. What's up, sister? My friends went and got raptured, and all I got was this stupid T-shirt. I love it. It's perfect. It's perfect. Amen. Listen, th this might be a two-parter. This this might be a two-parter, and if and if it is a two-parter, I'm gonna go Tuesday. So I'm not gonna wait a week, cause I mean I basically got the second part ready, but I just don't know if I can do a, a monster three-hour, four-hour. I'm just I'm whooped and. You know, I want to be able to chew on this first part. Jack Burton. Who are you? I'm Jack Burton. That's who. Or, or no, who's Jack Burton? I am. <laughs> yeah, hey, man. I just, I just felt like... Uh, I don't know, just instead of trying to do it all at once, it, it might be easier. And the second part will be sweet. So this part's going to be sweet. And all glory to God, God willing. And we'll just see how it goes. So instead of just trying to jam it all up in one, then I, I thought about two parts. I almost even felt like... The Lord was taking pressure off me just to do the two. Amen, amen. Revelation 13. So did everybody, did everybody see Rock Island Books video? 
Amen. Amen, Salvation Zone. <laughs> I like that name. Yes, I do. I get hyped up and I go fast. I'm trying to stay calm. Look, I don't even know how I do it. I I'm telling you, I'm exhausted. It's just nonstop doing stuff, mental, no sleep. I mean, everybody's got to be in that same boat, but... We are getting it done. We are going right to the end. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I saw it about next year and turned it off. Listen, you guys, do you remember what I said on the last live? Do you remember how I started the last live? I did the Yom Kippur War in 73. David Ben-Gurion died in 73. That's 50 years till this year. So I thought it could be a jubilee in 2023. So even though Rock Island, you know, CJ Lovett came up with a, a double jubilee, which really doesn't make sense because, you know, a jubilee is every 50 years. So I, I rewatched it. I don't know. The, the double jubilee throws me off. But even his starting date is 4005 BC. Most scholars will always say 4004. So he could be off a year. But here's the point. If he's truly figured out that the jubilee is 2023 to 2024, stay with me. Think about this. Why would... What's up, sister? Why would we be raptured? Why would we be raptured on the following year after a jubilee? That doesn't make any sense. So the jubilee year, the double jubilee, or or not the double is 2031, but 2023 to 2024, if that's a jubilee, you know, what are we waiting for? That, that sounds like a rapture. So I was saying it's a possible jubilee, just guessing, because, you know, I, I can't track the calendars. So if 2023 is the first jubilee that would ever be fulfilled in the Bible, it, it makes perfect sense if it's a jubilee. So I thought, I thought he proved the rapture is this year and not next year. And listen, the tribulation's not starting next year either. Anyway, so that look at that's what we're going to do tonight and really the next time with the Psalms. I'm going to show you that it cannot be, you know, next year. Yeah, look at he's, I mean, he's figuring out the calendar, so. Yeah, and listen, the whole rapture gap, I mean, mostly I've always thought it's like the same day. We get raptured, that's it. The dispensation's over, the church age is over, now it's in the tribulation. Now I know the covenant's got to be done, all that. Jesus has to break the seal in heaven. So could there be a couple of days gap? A couple of days makes sense. So... Anyway, we'll have to see how that plays out. Yeah, but listen, it's not its not that he's wrong completely. I, th I think he's wrong about the tribulation start for sure because of the songs. But if he's right about the Jubilee, then it's right on the money. He's still saying the Jubilee is 2023 to 2024. What better year to be raptured on a jubilee that that that's the best year and listen people misunderstood me when i said this jubilee is in the bible but it's never been fulfilled in the bible so yeah we read about it in leviticus 25 but it but it hasn't been fulfilled there's no spot where it says and the jews celebrated jubilee that's what i'm saying so people misunderstood what I was saying there. But look, I, I think he confirmed the rapture for 2023. So I don't know. That's, that's kind of the way I see it. 
Yeah, look at most most watchmen are on you know September and, and remember September September eleventh is a Lule twenty five. So a Lule twenty five is the Amos eight. It's the summer basket of fruit. It's the final summer harvest of fruit. Micah seven two, which is rapture. The, the fruit, the summer fruit is gone. We are gone. So, listen, it's all perfect. I believe we are going to be raptured. Yeah, well, I don't know. Listen, it's, once we get through both these studies, you know, with the Psalms, hopefully you'll see it differently, like, you know, see, listen, this stuff you're about to learn tonight is hidden. Nobody knows this. People really don't know what is going on here. So, yeah, you talk, you're talking about Rock Island books dragged it out. Yeah, I mean, he was going one at a time. I, I, I don't know why he's doing the short videos. Yes, I believe the rapture is this year, 2023. Listen, probably the 25th of Elul, which is September 11th. I'm not rock solid on that date, but I'm rock solid on the rapture this year. I'm rock solid on the summer fruits. Micah 7, 2, Amos 8, other places. I mean, uh, it's it's all culminating to now, to now. That That's what it's culminating to. So, yeah, I mean, look at the world. The world's on fire. Could you, could you even imagine being here another year, going through all the stuff they're doing to us? I mean, it, it'd just be crazy. And look, it's possible, but I don't think it's possible. I really don't. I mean, listen, Daniel 9, chapter 2, it says Daniel understood by the books the number of years. So Daniel read Jeremiah, figured out the 70-year um, exile was almost up. So he used the Bible to figure it out. That's all we're doing. We're doing the math. So the Bible, you can figure it out. It's a treasure hunt for this rapture, an absolute treasure hunt. I mean, is God up there crossing his arms like this? You'll never get it. You'll never get it. No way. No way. Keep trying. Go ahead, but you ain't going to get it. I mean, he's not doing that. He wants us to figure it out. So once you get in that mindset, you know, it, it's different. And look at Psalm 49. God literally said, I'm going to give you enigmas. I'm going to give you riddles. What's up, brother? Can you figure them out? I'm going to give you a riddle. Can you figure it out? That's what God is saying. So it, that's God's own word. So anybody that, you know, nobody knows the day or the hour, you'll never know, it could be 500 years from now. All that stuff is gibberish. It, you got to listen to what God said. So what did that say about the fig tree? Yeah, the fig tree started in 1949. So that's that's what it is. It's 1949, you know, get a little ahead of ourselves here, but that's when the fig tree started, not 1948. They were in a war less than 24 hours later. So nothing bloomed, nothing blossomed. And listen, when they were in a war, they really didn't have the country yet. So even though Ben-Gurion said, hey, we're the state of Israel, um, it didn't mean that that's a done deal. The, the world was coming against them. The surrounding nations were saying, no, we're going to annihilate you, destroy you. If they would have lost that war, there's, there's no nation. There's no Israel. There's, there's no fig tree. 
So it, it was 49, not 1950. 1949, everything happened. They made it to the United Nations, you know, formed a government, the whole thing. So it's all there. Man, I wish this thread was bigger. Once it goes up, I can't see it. What's up, Brother Greg? A little too today. I saw the new moon was spotted. Praise God. So we're on a 23-day countdown till 9-11. 23 days. Make sure you have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Him alone. In him alone. Listen, we, we went to like a farmer's market type store today, me and the wife. And there's, um, I don't know if anybody knows any Mennonites. You ever run into a Mennonite? They're, they're good people. They, you know, they run like farmer's markets type things. And uh, at least around here they do. So they wear all the garb because I can't see without them. So they wear, you know, the, the head thing and the, and the whole thing and they're good people and they're Christians. So I was, you know, witness, not witnessing to them, but just talking about the Lord and look at, they believe you can lose your salvation. So I started thinking about it because that's a Lule 25 sister. Lule 25 is nine eleven. So it was sad because listen, that's probably why they do it. They wear the plain clothes. You know, they, they, they're, you know, they're not like the Amish. The Amish are overboard, right? The Mennonites will, you can have a cell phone and stuff like that. But I just thought, look at these poor people. They're trying to keep their salvation. You cannot add to anything Christ did. Works is all after your salvation. You can be a, a whatever, you know, good Christian, bad Christian, some works, no works. Listen, look at 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 says that some people's works get burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. They don't have a reward. They suffer loss, but they themselves were saved. So their salvation was Christ alone, and then their works were no good. So the people that think you can lose your salvation will look at a slob type person like me who didn't live a great, perfect Christian life and they'll say, ah, you know, you're not saved. If you were saved, you wouldn't have that habitual sin. If you were saved, you wouldn't say that. You wouldn't have listened to that joke or, or whatever. And listen, technically, we're not supposed to sin. We're not supposed to do evil things on purpose. But it's not, see what I'm saying? So they'll say you're not saved because you're not living it. That's the opposite of what salvation is. Salvation is the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee said, I'm glad I'm not like him. I pay my tithes. I say my prayers. Man, he, he's a loser. I'm glad I'm not like him. And then Jesus said, what did the publican say? He couldn't even lift his head up. He beat his chest and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said he went home justified, not the Pharisee who was living a good life. It was the publican that went home justified, saved, because he said, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the way we get saved. So... You know, I hate that people can't see that and they just want to add to it. And again, it's the confusion is the people like me that believe Christ alone, the other people think I'm saying, I can do whatever I want. I can sin, I can rob banks, I can kill people, I, I can do whatever I want, but I'm still saved, it doesn't matter. That's what they think we're saying. And we're not saying that. We're not saying that. So it's 32 AD. Yes, I can refute it with the Psalms. Amen. 
yeah, you know what? They do go hand in hand. I mean, it, it's a, it's a tell. It's a tell. That's why I always say the foaming at the mouth post tribber. I'm not talking about the post tribber who got taught wrong and they didn't study it for whatever reason. I'm talking about the adamant one who wants to go in the tribulation and blah, blah, blah. They don't understand salvation and, you know, pre-trib, once saved, always saved. They don't get it. Yeah, Calvinists. And, and look, at Calvinists kind of get a bad rap a little bit. I don't agree with all they say, obviously. But, uh, you know, it's... As soon, as soon as you say once saved, always saved, or really, if you say I'm chosen from eternity past, then they label you a Calvinist like it's something wrong. You know, that's the one thing that Calvinists have right, that we were chosen in eternity past. Now, they botch it up in a lot of other areas. You know, Calvinists do not have good eschatology. So... You know, and look, the flip side of being a Calvinist is an Arminian. Arminians think you can lose your salvation. So it's, you know, people say Calvinist like it's the worst thing in the world. Amen. Professing themselves to be wise. Yeah, and listen, the, the post-tribbers just really end up kind of being a works-based salvation. They say, we got to die for Christ. They don't even understand the story. They just don't understand the fact that, you know, we are being saved from the judgment of God. Why would God judge his bride? Makes no sense. Amen, glass of water. And look, that's that's tribulation talk too right there. That's tribulation talk. The criteria to be chosen, that's a good question. I like that question. Do you know what it is? It said it pleased God to choose the ones that he chose. Look at Romans 9. After Paul drops a bomb on everybody, us included, when we read that, he says before they were ever born, before they ever did right or wrong, Jacob I loved, Esau I've hated. And then the very next verse, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, no. And then Paul says, as I told Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. That's God's words. So you got to argue with him. If you think God is unfair, and a lot of people do, they think he's unfair, you got to argue it out with him, not me. I'll just read it to you. I, I just quoted it out of the Bible. God will have mercy on whoever he wants to. He'll have compassion on whoever he wants to. That's it. That's the bottom line. So when you realize this as a Christian and you go to the deeper level of Man, how did I get saved? How does my salvation actually work? God chose me in eternity past, and then he called me when I became alive and became a person. I heard the gospel. I believed in it. I fully trusted in his son, Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, that he rose from the dead. I believed it 100%. And the reason I believe it all is because he chose me way back in eternity past. I love that doctrine. I fall on my knees on that doctrine. I remember when I first studied that out, I said, this is amazing. I can't believe it. Now, you do think of the other side of it, like, whoa, what if somebody's not chosen? It's part of it. But I'm extra thankful that I was chosen. My eyes were open. Listen, how many times have you witnessed to people the simple, beautiful gospel? Simple, simple. What's it take for somebody to be saved? You're just telling them, hey, Christ is God. 
He gave up glory, became a man, born of a virgin, walked this earth, lived a perfect life, and said, this is my message. I'm the son of God. I'm going to die for the sins of the world, reconcile everybody to my father. If you simply believe in me and trust in me, you can live with me forever and all eternity. That's the most simplest, beautiful thing in the world. Who on earth would ever pass that up? And yet when we witness to people, they pass it up. They're not interested. Ah, religion's not for me. Hey, that's good for you. I'm glad for you. It's not for me. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, it's crazy. Because John 6, 44, Jesus said, Don't murmur amongst yourself unless my Father who sent me draws you in you will not be able to come to me. It's as simple as that. So as a Christian, we shouldn't get bent out of shape that God picked us and not others. That's like reverse. So if you're on the other side and you don't like it, well, then it makes sense. You'll probably not get saved and you think God's unfair. Listen, remember the last parable? The last parable in Matthew 25 is really talking about the Old Testament saints. I, I got to do a video on that sometime. That's, you know, we always apply that to ourselves. That's not to ourselves. Remember when the guy said he buried, he had one talent and he buried it. He said, I knew you were a hard man. Do you remember that? It's an oddball line. Like, how do you know that Jesus was a hard man? Jesus came down here, loved us so much he died for us. So it's just a, now my interpretation of that is they were under the law and nobody could keep the law. So he didn't look for the promise of the Messiah coming. He just looked at the law and said, I know you were a hard man. But, you know, my point is this is what people do when they hear the doctrine of election being chosen, whatever. And they just hear it and they think God is unfair. I mean, look at, it doesn't fully pertain, but the stupid line that Oprah Winfrey made 20 years ago on her show when she was all cooking, she said, I read a verse in the Bible that said, God's a jealous God. Man, he's jealous of me. I'm not going to worship a God like that. You know, and that was her big epiphany. And that's why she left Christianity. So it's just, listen, if you get a, a, a a thought in your head that's negative towards God, that's not a good sign. It doesn't mean we can't question things, study things, pray about things. Lord, what does this mean? This seems harsh. You know, where are we going with this? And, and then, you know, you learn it. You, you get it done. So anyway, it's, I thank God I'm saved. And that's the bottom line. Yeah, legalist. Couldn't keep the law. He was a hard man. So I do think that applies to the Old Testament people. And that will be their judgment in 2030. Amen, amen. Hellfire preachers are hard to come by. Yeah, Jesus sprinkled on top. Yeah, look, okay, we'll we'll uh, we'll know as soon as we're raptured. We will know. The Bible says we look in a glass darkly, but you know when that perfect comes, when when we see him, we will know like we are known. So we're not going to class in heaven. I can tell you that right now. It's going to be flowing through us. Amen. Amen. All right, let's lift this live up to the Lord. Praise God, Heavenly Father. Let me tell of your glory and your holy eternal word. Father, we love you. I pray that every eye would be open, hearts open, ready to receive your truth, always testing your word. That's a given, Lord. You commanded us to do that and just may you be lifted up, Lord. May we glorify you, glorify your name, glorify your word. Be with me, Lord. I can't do any of this without you. 
You know, I sweat it out, Lord, always trying to get it right, make it flow, make it be good. So be with me, Father. I trust you and count on you, Lord. Oh, I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we lift this up. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. All right, here we go. Amen. You guys ready? We ready to go here? Praise God. All right. All right, I'm going to have to look down here now, so you guys will have to talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> But look, at, I want you to think about what we're talking about tonight. I'm telling you, it, it, this will be, it, it posts automatically, praise God. So just think about it. Don't, we have to meditate. We have to chew. Think about this. And it, it's, what God did is amazing. All right, let's go. I just wanted to read, let me read this first. Luke chapter 24, uh, verse 44. And he said, this is him appearing to the 11 disciples. And he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Okay, so even look at that. It's possible that God can open up our understanding so we can understand the scriptures. This is not a foreign thing. This is not a... We'll never know. We'll never know. Oh, he's got a different opinion. He's got a different opinion. We, If we love the truth, we can get to it. So that's that's why I read that. God can open up the meaning of the scriptures to us. Praise God. Brother Paul's in the house. What's up, brother? All right. Amen. Let's go. Let's see if we can get this done. All glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right. So listen, what we're going to do tonight, the easy, the easy way out is to say this. Well, God brought the Jews back in 1948 and that fulfilled prophecy. Boom. End of story. You know, we've probably all said that. Why don't we learn the story of that prophecy and all that took place in it? Now, I'm not going to do all of it because I'd have to read you all the verses that said God's going to scatter them and bring them back in the latter days. And then he has a slew of verses that says, I'll bring them back in the latter days, 2,800 years ago. So these are old, thousands of years old prophecy. So when God did this, it was miraculous. And that's why Psalm 49, he made an announcement to the world. So I'm going to start before that, but I, I just wanted to say that. Okay, the book of Psalms is the 19th book in the Bible. What we're learning tonight is that God took this book of Psalms and he numbered them with the years. So Psalm 1, 1901, Psalm 2, 1902, Psalm 3, 1903, Psalm 48, 1948, Psalm 120, our year 2020. This is what I'm telling you. So don't close your ears to it. Listen to the whole thing. Chew, pray, test. And listen, I just want to say this too. It doesn't mean every single word in Psalm 29 pertains to the year 1929. So as part of the mystery, you have to dig it out. You have to find it. So here's my whole point with this study tonight. 
it and listen, I am not a history buff. I slept through high school, didn't go to college. I, I didn't, you know, I, I barely scraped by. I was a slacker. So when I watch these documentaries about World War II, I'm really learning this for the first time. But Unless you know what happened, you can't dig out these mysteries. So think about it. How are you going to pick out Psalm 34 and say, man, what happened in 1934? Then you got to go through, you know, the years. So listen, you just, you got to dig it out. Again, it doesn't mean every word in the Psalm is for our 1948 or 49 or whatever the year. It's still a mystery to find it and dig it out. Put it together. Put together the enigma, the riddle, the puzzle. So that's the the theme of this. It's not every word. You got to find it. And listen to my regular family that's in here. A bunch of you guys are in here from my Clapper world. And when I started at TikTok, you're going to get an, a new verse right off the rip that we haven't studied before. So we have studied this before. But there, there's a new one right off the rip here. And I'm telling you, the Lord blesses me. See, you got to remember, I wanted to do this for YouTube, you know, because God, I felt like God wanted me to do a YouTube video. I told you, never been thought I was called to YouTube, nothing. And all of a sudden I thought, man, I should make a YouTube video. Crazy. So that's how all this happened. So now I got to go back into this study that I've already been doing for months and months. And we haven't even done it in a while. So I had to get my brain right, get my heart right. And then when I got into it, the Lord blessed. He blessed. He always does. And I just, look, I feel like a fool because I'm like, oh, Lord, uh, you know, how am I going to be able to do this? And then I get in there and he blesses me. So all glory to God. God is so good. All right. The book of Psalms is the 19th book in the Bible. It has 150 chapters. It covers a thousand year period. So from Moses time, roughly 1440 BC, all the way up to the lifetime of Ezra, around 440 BC, 430 BC. It's a thousand year period that it covers. Now, what the information I'm giving you is from what scholars think. So it can be off by a little. I'm not dogmatic about this stuff. But it says, most Psalms were composed during the lifetimes of David and Solomon. David wrote 75 Psalms. Solomon wrote two. Moses wrote one Psalm, 90, famous Psalm 90. But some people think he wrote, he wrote all the way to 100. Now there's 48 anonymous Psalms that we don't know who wrote them. So ever think about that. Um, listen, has anybody ever learned this and said it while you're witnessing to somebody? I've had this etched in my brain. This is what I'll say. I'll say, the Bible was written over an 1,800-year period by 40 different authors, and it all gels perfectly. There's not one contradiction. Only God can do that. So that was like my standard line, right? So has anybody ever heard that before? You must have. But when you look at the anonymous authors in the Bible, there's 48 anonymous Psalms written that we don't know. There's only eight authors named in the book of Psalms. So I thought, man, there could be more than 40 authors. There could be 80 author, authors or 70 or whatever. So, you know, why I, I just kind of parakeeted that when I was first a Christian and learned that. But anyway, I just chewed on that for a second thinking, you know, Lord could have used more than 40 authors. All right, here, here's the uh, belief. They think that Ezra and the leaders of Israel around 440, 430 BC put the Psalms in their orders. So think about that right off the rip. 150 Psalms in order to match up with our generation of years had to be put in a perfect order. Only God could do that. So as Ezra and these leaders are putting this together, it had to be perfect. 
150 psalms. These aren't chronological. Psalm 2 is about tribulation. Psalm 2 is at the end. So just think about that. Even that, we are in awe of God. Of course, we're in awe of the whole word. You know, it's God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. But listen, I was an anti-person of the chapters, the verses, the numbers, all that. Because I said, no, God didn't do that. It's God's word. Man separated it into the numbers. Well, I don't believe that anymore. It's too perfect. So God, and then if you think about it, why would God let man put it in the order that man wants to put it into? Why would God let man number the chapters as man wanted to do it? So listen, I, it, that took me a while to be flipped on that, but there's too much evidence. So I'm flipped on that. It's too much evidence. So 150 Psalms have to be in a perfect order, and they are. All right. Now, this was just a quick thought. We know the appointments of God, the appointed times is translated feast. The word is moed, moedim. I'm drinking water, by the way. I don't like water. <clears throat> okay, appointed times. God said in the seven feasts of Leviticus 23, he said, these will be holy convocations to you, dress rehearsals. So they're doing this for 1,500 years. So when the real came, they would recognize it. So when Christ died as the Passover lamb, they didn't even get it. They didn't get the dress rehearsal. They didn't get the type. It, they were doing a type. They were doing, you know, sim, symbolism or the figure. They didn't get it. So I'm thinking about this. Now, you guys have probably heard this before, but Psalm 113 to 118 is called the Hallel, the, the praise songs. They sang these at Passover. So right before Jesus went to the cross, He's singing his own psalms about how they rejected him and they're rejecting the chief cornerstone. They're singing these songs. So that was sung at Passover and the Psalms of Ascent, which is going to be part two. That's part two, by the way, the Psalms of Ascent, 120 to 134. I found out they were called the Great Hallel. The Great Hallel, the Psalms of Ascent, 15 Psalms starting with 120 to 134, which is 2020 to 2034. It's perfect. I'm telling you, you will see it. All right, but here, here's my point I want to make. The Psalms were like God's radio. I mean, think about it. These were the songs that they sung. Look at us. We, we, we started off with albums, and, you know, radio, albums, cassette tapes, CDs, MP3 players, now the music on our phone, all this. We have all kinds of forms of music. They had the Psalms. They had to sing these. Now, tell me if this has ever happened to you before. If somebody's got to raise their hand on this. Have you ever, and look at, we've memorized a lot of secular songs, so I do want to say that. I got a ton of secular songs memorized. That doesn't mean every secular song is evil and of the devil. It doesn't mean that. But yeah, eight tracks. So I'm just saying it kind of is a waste. I wish all these songs would have been somehow into music, you know, where we could have did the songs. But anyway... The Jews missed their dress rehearsals and they missed the songs that they were singing. So has this ever happened to anybody? You, you've heard, um, it doesn't matter, Hotel California from the Eagles. And you've listened to it over and over. And then all of a sudden, one day, you're, you're singing the song for the millionth time and you say, oh, that's what he's talking about. I didn't even know what he was talking about. I have the whole song memorized and I never thought about the words that I was singing. Somebody tell me that's happened to them before. <laughs> 
and I'm listen, that has literally happened to me before. Somebody give me a yay on that. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to I'm going to trust that it's happened, happened a lot. Praise God. So you get that. Now think about that. Isn't it weird? Isn't it weird? You know the words, you belt it out, blah, 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 and then it's weird. It just hits you, and you think, wait a second, that's what he's talking about. That's what that line means. Listen, I haven't done that a lot, but I've, I've done it dozens of times throughout my life with certain songs. It's weird. So look at, this could be the way God blinded the Jews, because remember, they were blinded in part, they were supposed to ultimately reject the Messiah, so the Gentiles could be grafted in, we know the whole story, Romans 11, but, uh, but think about it, they're doing dress rehearsals, they're singing the Psalms about their Messiah, and they, they were with them, and they didn't even understand it, so anyway, that just hit me like a ton of bricks, like, that's probably what happened to the Jews. They, they, they had them all down by heart, but they didn't know what they meant. So until understanding is opened up, I guess that's the way it goes. And look, I just wanted to attach this. Psalm 50. Psalm 50. I'm going to start with verse 7. All right, this is words in red. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you, I am God, even your God. I will not rep reprove you for your sacrifices or your burned offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of your house, nor he goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills." I know all the fowl of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I was hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. So when I read that, God is saying, I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your animal sacrifices. I don't want your blood. Do you get it? The Jews were killing and sacrificing all these animals just as a ritual, going through the motions. And God is saying, you don't know the song. You're not listening to the words. You don't understand what you're doing. You're just sacrificing animals for the sake of sacrificing them. You don't get it that this is for your sin and there's a lamb of God that's coming. So I just kind of put that together and thought, you know, that's what's going on because the Jews obviously didn't get it and sometimes we don't get it. All right, praise God. Now we got to back up a little bit. Okay. How are we going to do this? Here we go. So we're going to be in Psalm 38. And look, this if I can do this, this study is good. So stay with this. Praise God. All right, that one's done. All right, now listen, I'm going to flip the camera around, and it, it, it won't be perfect. I don't have any technology to throw it up on my screen. I just push a button on the phone, but I want you to hear this. I want you to hear it. It's part of this study. Every time I flip on the TV, it's only going to be about two to three minutes at a time, so it's not going to be long, just a couple of minutes, but it's important to this study. And the first nugget is going to come right out of this. So here we go. We're going to start off with this one. Let me see if I can flip this around. All right. And I'm going to tell you how you can watch this. Like many young Jews in the Western world in the 1930s, 
I lived in two worlds. There was the tranquil world as a Cambridge graduate engaged in teaching and research, a leader in Cambridge Union debates. This was a world that would soon vanish. Can you guys hear that? Is that sound coming through the TV? Anybody? Okay. All right, this is right before World War II. So he was a young Jew, college graduate, the whole thing, and he's telling about life here. Okay. And there was the world of Jewish anguish. Fireworks. The last pre-war Zionist Congress assembled at Geneva in August 1939. I was present at the age of 24, accompanying the Zionist President Chaim Weizmann, whom I revered as my leader and mentor. That guy is in the I Bible. I gave August the 24th, when news reached the Zionist Congress of the pact between Foreign Minister Molotov and Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop. War was now an imminent certainty. The despair of Chaim Weizmann, David Ben-Gurion and Moshe Sharet seemed to cry out through the silent camera lens. Adolf Hitler's monstrous design for the Jews became clear after the night of November the 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Soon after, Hitler spoke for the first time in public about the extermination of European Jewry. The members of the Nazi party and the Hitler Youth embraced Hitler's anti-Semitism. Hitler Youth. First, the brutality was sporadic. It was only later that the campaign for total annihilation became a centrally organized nightmare. All right. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but I'm going to recap it. I'm telling you, that is important. Okay. So the guy narrating it was the 24-year-old. All right, the two guys that he showed on there was Haim Weissman and David Ben-Gurion. So Haim Weissman became ultimately Israel's first president. You know David Ben-Gurion was the first prime minister of Israel. That was August 24th, 1939. That was the last Zionist Congress trying to really see if the war was coming, okay? So, uh, man, I, I pray you guys get this. So November 9th, 1938 is called the Night of the Broken Glass. That's what we just heard. So they were smashing into Jewish homes, businesses, pulling them out. They killed a 100 Jews that night. You can Google it, look it up. It's called the night of broken glass. There's a Hebrew word for it, but that's what it means. Okay. That was November 9th, 1938. And that Congress, when they had their hands in their head, they knew the war was coming. They couldn't stop this. So after the night of the broken glass, Hitler made his first public speech. Now, I don't, I don't, you probably couldn't read the words on the TV, but he said, we're going to systematically annihilate all the Jews in Europe, okay? So I'm going to show you how it's in here. God put it in the Bible, you know, 2,800 years prior, 2,400 years prior. So Heim Weitzman is a big deal. David Ben-Gurion is a big deal. And this night is a big deal. But listen, 
Did you see the kids on there? Could you see it on there? It said the Hitler Youth. Did you ever think about that? The kids are cheering Adolf Hitler on, wanting to kill the Jews, getting their fervor up for killing the Jews. Listen, I didn't know a lot about this. I never learned all this. So I learned it from the documentaries. So he had everybody riled up. And that was shortly after November 9th, the night of broken glass, 1938, because that first Zionist Congress was August of the next year. So look at this verse I found, and this is unbelievable. Psalm 38, which matches up with the year 1938. Verse 19. So Psalm 38, verse 19. Flip it around, and it's 1938. Only God could do this. Look what it says. But my enemies are lively. They're vigorous. That's why I showed it to you on the TV. They're cheering. They're going crazy. They're all cheering Hitler as he's going through the crowds. Hail Hitler. Hail Hitler. But my enemies are lively, vigorous, and they are strong. And they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. That is the German citizens. That's the Nazi party. That's the children, the Hitler youth. Look at that. God put it in Psalm 38, verse 19. Flip it around. It's 1938. But my enemies are lively and they are strong. They that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. So the children have no reason to hate the Jews. The citizens have no reason to hate the Jews. That was Hitler's own twisted mind. So praise God. This is how we're going to realize that these Psalms really do match up with the years. All right. I'm just going to take a second, make sure I got it. And again, that was Hitler's first public speech that said he's going to annihilate all the Jews in Europe. It's called the Night of Broken Glass. So if you want to look that up, it's all there. All right, so I'm going to, you know, not go super quickly, but go quickly through these Psalms. Okay, Psalm 39. Now remember, the Zionist Congress, would they say they knew war was coming and it was imminent and they couldn't stop it. Weissman, Ben-Gurion, 1939, they said, I can't believe this war's coming, and he's going to kill all the Jews. So again, 38, they already smashed the businesses, robbed them, pillaged them, killed them, did the whole thing. Psalm 39, verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with, with silence. I held my peace, even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Then spoke I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. People, this is literal. This is literal. Make me to know my end, the measure of my days. They knew they were going to die. They were being rounded up. And, and listen, just so I can say this, because it's going to post... Um, this guy's name for YouTube is Frank Marco. Frank Marco, M-A-R-K-O-W. He has nine or ten parts on this whole 1948 
um, not just 1948, World War II, the whole thing. Israel becoming a nation. So it's called Israel, a nation born. Frank Marco. So you want to watch these. I'm telling you, you want to watch them. All right. Look at... Um, And look, I hope you see that. They knew they were going to die. So this is how we're digging this out. So Psalm 40, I'm going to read 12 through 15. And look, I'm, I'm cherry picking this a little bit. There's a lot more in here if you want to dig it out. So Psalm 40, 12 through 15. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. My iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame that say to me, aha, aha, A-H-A. So I had to look up that word, aha. It means a cry of joy. It means glorying over an enemy's misfortune. So think about what the Jews went through. This was written thousands of years ago in our time, in the 1940s, this is what they went through in the Holocaust. Now think about it. Six million Jews died. We think we think 3,000 dying on 9-11 was a lot. Think about six million Jews dying. I mean, it's just unbelievable. All right, and listen, out of this book I told you, The Hidden Prophecies from J.R. Church, I only wanted to read one thing. And listen, I'm being honest with you. This is all my study. I didn't even agree with stuff he had in this book. So he just had different interpretations than I did. But this is one part I did want to pull out of the book because it pertains to what I just read. Okay, here we go. The year was 1940 and it held little joy for the Jews of Europe. For example, in Poland... Heim Kaplan was a Hebrew teacher and an author who became entrapped in the Warsaw Ghetto after November 15th. He kept a meticulous diary. Quote, we are used to seeing the victims of the sword in war. We are used to counting the dead, the wounded, the physically maimed, and the mentally disturbed, he wrote. In previous wars, he continued, the front had almost no organic connection with the nation in the rear, its creator. Not so today. Modern war is a people's war. Its fronts extend from the dwellings of the paupers to the halls of the princes. Every citizen is a soldier on the battlefield. Okay, so then he, he goes on to say, I mean, I got to read this. The conquerors, Kaplan reported, have begun a new political campaign. Gangs of youths, Polish youth, you won't find one adult among them. They're kids. They're armed with clubs, sticks, and all kinds of dangerous weapons. They make pogroms against the Jews. Mar He's writing in his diary. March 28th, 1940. These roving bands directed by some invisible hand looted, maimed, and robbed at will. These sons of Ham just a year ago shouted in their patriotic fervor, long live Poland. They now shout in their conquered capital, because remember, Hitler destroyed Poland. So you got to know the story. He dropped bombs. He went through there. Poland was decimated. So they were shouting, long live Poland, you know, patriots in the presence of those who, so now in the presence of those 
who conquered their land, long live Hitler. Death to Poland. We want Poland without Jews. So just think about it. So he said, these accursed youth walking in the ruins of their homeland organize demonstrations in honor of the Fuhrer. That was out of this man's diary in 1940, which matches up with what I just said. Let those be ashamed that say to me, aha, aha, rejoicing in the enemy. Praise God, let's go. Psalm 41. In June of 1941, the Nazis began the absolute systematic killing of the Jews. They had killing centers. Now this is huge. This one, listen to me, this one should blow your mind. Psalm 41, I'm going to read verses 5 through 8. Look what it says. My enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die and his name perish? And if he comes to see me, he speaks vanity. He speaks wickedly. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes abroad, he tells it. All that hate me whisper together against me. Against me do they devise my hurt. An evil disease, say they, clings fast to him. And now that he lies, he shall rise up no more. Okay, I hope you guys are listening to this. Look what it says. My enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die? This can all be looked up. It's in the documentaries. It's on Google. So look it up. This is what they did. They injected the Jews with all kinds of poison. They cut limbs out of them. They stuck them in ice water. They, you know, just put them in snow. They starved them to death. They starved them to death to see how long it would take for them to die. So did you get that? My enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die? God put that in his Bible. Look this guy up. His name was Rudolf Hess. He was the deputy Fuhrer to Hitler. He's the one that said they used a stopwatch to time the death of the Jews. So when they injected them with poison, they would take a stopwatch and time it how long they would die. That is right out of the Bible. All kinds of evil experiments. We all should know that by now. Starving them, blah, blah, blah. Listen, this guy was 93 years old and he hung himself in prison in 1987. This Rudolf Hess, who was the deputy Fuhrer to Hitler. And he's the one that told a lot of what they did to the Jews. Now get this, you can look it up. The University of Würzburg, Germany, had an undergraduate course on these experiments. Did you hear me? They had an undergraduate course in their college on the experiments of the Jews killing them. Look what the Bible says. And if, talking about his enemies, my enemies speak evil of me, when shall he die and his name perish? If he comes to see me, listen, they came from colleges to witness these experiments. He speaks wickedly. His heart gathers iniquity to himself. Get this. This is the eternal word of God. When he goes abroad, he tells of it. They went and gave lectures in the colleges of, again, listen, they would cut off kneecaps and watch them how it affected the way they walked. They did all kinds of atrocities to these people and God put it in here. 
and it happened in 1941. 1941. So I thought that was amazing. This is to us, it's horrible to learn this stuff, but it's proof that God was right on the money with the years. All right. And listen, verse 8, an evil disease, say they, say they, clings fast to him. And now he lies and he rises up no more. They, they would give the Jews diseases. They caught diseases because they, they were living in filth. And, and listen, the bodies that the Americans, when they went in and the Americans saw the bodies and the ones that were still alive, they, they, they just looked like walking corpses. These people were ugh, put through the ringer. All right, Psalm 42. As the heart pants after the water brooks, As the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after you, O oh God. Can you imagine the prayers that were going up? My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? That's kind of a little thought. I thought they knew they're going to die. They're going to appear before God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? Where is your God? Think about that. So verse 10 of Psalm 42, as with a sword in my bones. Listen, you can take that literal. We spiritualize everything. Oh, I had a bad day. It's like a sword that pierced my bones. This was literal. As with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say daily to me, where is your God? That is Psalm 42, the killing. I, listen, I, I just want to take a pause here. I know the Jews didn't believe in Christ. So the Jews of the 1940s that were being exterminated in Europe by Hitler, all these bands, people jumped on board, right? I wonder if they got saved. Like, they, they, the Jews have the right God. You know they're praying to the right God. I know they don't believe in Christ and they've rejected him as a nation. I, I just wonder, I wonder if these poor people that were literally tortured to death, poisoned to death, starved to death, froze to death, uh, they, they put them in ice water. They would time how long it would take before they died. I just wonder if they got saved. Because could you imagine going through the Holocaust and dying this horrible death, and then you go to hell because you didn't believe in Christ? Um, yeah, Christ is the Savior of the world, but somewhere in there. I just, I don't know. Like, could God have saved them? I hope so. We won't know. All right, so now get this one. All right, Psalm 43. This is in the thick of it. 43 and 44 were the worst years that the most Jews died. Remember, this is a short period of time. And, and, and listen, one of the documentaries I watched, they got so cooking, the, the, the non-Nazis that were rounding people up, they were killing 100,000 Jews per month. 100,000 Jews per month were being killed. Think about that. Okay, look at Psalm 43. If there's any skeptics in here, look at this one. 43 verse 1. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation, Germany. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Remember, they all rallied around Hitler. Look what it says. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Singular. That is Hitler. 
deliver me from an ungodly nation. Germany, deliver me from this unjust man, Hitler. That is Psalm 43, verse 1. And listen, I just want to say this too. I'm, I believe this already 100%. For me, the Psalms matching up with the years, it's not a debate for me. I already believe this. I've studied enough of it to know that this is what God did. This is the mystery in the Psalms from Psalm 49. Okay, praise God. Psalm 44, verse 1. This is the Jews talking. Look at the verse 1s, and we're going to go over this. We have heard with our eyes, O God, our fathers have told us what work you did in their days in times of old. Look what they're saying. They're begging God. They're desperate. They've been crying out to him. Lord, we heard what you did for Moses. We heard what you did when you, you know, let him out of Egypt. You've won battles for him, won wars for him. We know your record. We have heard with our ears, O oh God, our fathers have told us what work you did in their days, in times of old, how you did drive out the heathen with your hand and planted them, how you did afflict the people and cast them out. Look at verse 17, 44, 17. All this has come upon us, yet have we not forgotten you, neither have we dealt falsely in your covenant. So they're even pulling up the covenant. God, don't you have a covenant with us? Aren't we your people? I mean, this is fascinating. All right, verse, still Psalm 44, verse 22 through 26. Again, literal. We take the word literal. Yea, for your sake are we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake, why sleep you, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Wherefore hide you your face? Why are you hiding your face from us, Lord? And forgot our affliction and our oppression. Remember, this started in 1938. This is 1944. Millions have been killed. I mean, just think about the context. Why, wherefore hide you your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? Question mark. For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the earth. Arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. They are begging, crying out to the Lord. Okay, for those of you that don't know, the war ended in 1945. September 2nd, 1945. Look at verse 1. Psalm 45, verse 1. Look at this. My heart is indicting a good matter. That means my heart is overflowing with a good matter. Whoa, something shifted here. I speak of the things which I have made concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So this word writer means to tell. It means a skilled scribe. The Jews were saying, Lord, I'm hearing good things. I'm hearing this war might be over with. If you end this war, I will be the best scribe. I will tell the world what you did for us ending this war and saving us. And I'm telling you, when you guys look at these documentaries, which I hope you do in these next couple of days, you will see that the Jews told this story over and over, the Holocaust stories. Listen, Holocaust survivors, they tell the story. They, they tell the story. It's interesting. My heart is overflowing with a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made. 
for the king, touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Now get this. Verse 5 says this. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under you. Now, this is my opinion. That verse 5 is the death of Hitler. Every time the Bible talks about God's arrows or sharp arrows, it means death. So hear it again. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. So 1943, who's Lord, deliver us from this unjust nation, this deceitful man. 1945, Hitler dies. The enemy of the king dies. Does anybody know what day Hitler died on? It was April 30th. He killed himself in his bunker. I know there's rumors Hitler was still alive. He was transported. I don't believe it because of the Bible. He died, shot himself. I wanted, look, I looked up the stories. They don't even know fully if he shot himself in the head. You know, they said he took cyanide and shot himself just so he would be dead. So I was hoping that he shot himself through the heart. And then it really would have matched up. But listen to this. God signed the death of Hitler. He died on April 30th. That's 430. Look up in the Hebrew lexicon what the word is on 430. April 30th, 430, 430. It's Elohim. It's Elohim. The triune God, 430. Hitler died on April 30th. I'm telling you, God put his signature on that. Boom. The sharp arrows in the king's enemy, 430, Elohim. I believe that 100%. God made sure he died on April 30th. Okay, praise God. Okay, Psalm 46. And listen, I, I'm just doing a few verses in each psalm, as you can see. So it's not, there's more in there. Okay, Psalm 46, verse 1. Look at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Verses 9 and 10. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in sunder. He burns the chariot in the fire. God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. This is 1946. The war ended in September of 45. Right here in Psalm 46, it says, he makes wars to cease. He causes wars to stop. That's what he did. He controls all the nations, even though it was horrible for the Jews. God has a reason why he did it. You know, we'll, we'll know ultimately in the end, but it matches up perfectly. Praise God. Let's go. Psalm 47. I'm going to read the whole thing. Nine verses. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible, meaning awesome. He is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. 
Sing you praises with understanding. God reigns over the heathen. God sits upon the throne of his holiness. Now get this, verse 9. The princes of the people are gathered together. Even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. People, this is a thousand percent. This is Heim Weissman, David Ben-Gurion. That's what it means. The princes of the people are gathered together. That's the rulers. That's the United Nations in 1947. Even the people of the God of Abraham. Listen, when you get into the story, Heim Weizmann was a scientist. He was a nuclear scientist. He was a chemist. He convinced Winston Churchill that the Jews needed a homeland. They listened to him because he helped ultimately build the atomic bomb. They needed him for his technology. So he was in on the whole deal, just like David Ben-Gurion was. So God put in Psalm 47, the rulers of the world, the United Nations, representing all the nations, and the people of God came together. They were gathered together to make this decision in 1947. I'm telling you, when you learn the story and watch these documentaries, and then you read these Psalms, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. So let me, uh, let me flip to this, Mark, real quick. And again, these are only two minutes, couple minutes long, but look. I want you to see it. I hope you guys are getting this. I know we all want to be raptured. It's rapture, rapture, rapture. 1948 was a giant miracle. We need to know why. All right, here we go. The throats of the delegates. To the Jewish people, politics was not a gamble. It was a science. The history of Israeli diplomacy is the history of, of cliffhangers. There's never been a case where our victory was assured. If we lost, we'd have been worse off than before. It's one thing not to have Jewish statehood confirmed, but to have Jewish statehood rejected is a much worse condition. Afghanistan, now, Argentina, Argentina, abstention. This is the vote in 1947 that we talk about. Abstain, France, yes. I am confident on the way you will behave in a so serious decision taken by this assembly. Because I am decided not to allow anybody to interfere in our decision. South Africa, yes. These people are fighting for their life. The resolution of the Dutch Committee of my staff was adopted by the That is the 1947 vote. Not reborn yet. Not reborn yet. This is still 47. I'm telling you, people, this is an amazing story. This is all God. Okay, and that bombs you saw right there is because all the ones that were against the Jews 
hated them, and instantly, this is where it leads up to the 1948 war. Okay? So listen, that vote, here's, I got to tell the story. You got to hear this. So the United Nations put forth the proposal first. The It, it was the 181 plan resolution, and they weren't even going to accept it. They were not going to accept the proposal to even be voted on. Do you know who changed that? It was the Russian ambassador. So all I could think of is God controls the nations. So the whole world was shocked when, and it's on the documentary, when the Russian ambassador stood up and said, hey, these people deserve a homeland. United States, everybody was looking like, this is what Russia's saying? So because of that, so because of that, they would put it to a vote in the United Nations. That's what I just showed you. So the proposal came up first, and then it went to the General Assembly. And listen, Heim Weitzman had to convince, I gotta show you, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but listen, the vote was 33 for, 13 against, and 10 abstained. So I don't know if you could hear it on the TV, but Afghanistan said no. France said yes, and then I forgot what other country, they said abstain. They didn't want to vote. So yeah, that was November 1947, right there. <laughs> you were born on that? But November 29th, the, the vote was. You were born the day after. Praise God, let's go. All right, let me just make sure I didn't miss nothing there. Okay, so that was big news. Again, Heim Weitzman. I'm telling you, you got to believe that. Even the people of God, the God of Abraham, that is Heim Weitzman, that is David Ben-Gurion, and a couple of the one narrating this, he was there too, and I forgot his name. And there was Herbert Samuel. He was another um, great, Israelite, he was the high commissioner, he was the first high commissioner of Palestine, they called it, before they called it Israel. And listen, I, I got to do this, praise God, he just made me see this. Heim Weitzman, the chemist that helped make the atomic bomb, he was a brilliant man. He had a famous quote in this documentary, which I wouldn't have known if I didn't watch it. He said, it's up to God to keep his promises. And, and they quoted Isaiah 11, 11 and 12. So I'm going to pause right real quick and read that. So that's what he was saying. He goes, we got to do our part, do everything we can to convince people that we deserve a homeland. And then it's up to God to keep his promises. They knew the promises that they were to come back to the land. Look at Isaiah 11, 11, and 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathos and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Praise God. Look at that. I love that. All right. So now it's going to get juicier. Here we go. Um, let me see. I'm not sure if I should do the second part here. Yeah, let me go to this part. This this part's good. All right, stay with me, peeps. Here we go. 
Harry S. Truman. March 1948, prominent military strategists, including Field Marshal Montgomery, Secretary of State George Marshall, and Secretary of Defense Horsall, were saying that the Jews would not be able to survive the imminent assault by the Arab regular armies. I remember one time talking to James Forrestal, who was Secretary of Defense, and he said, uh, Clark, you just don't understand this. It's a question of arithmetic. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there are 45 million Arabs and 350,000 Jews. And the 45 million Arabs are going to push the 350,000 Jews right into the ocean. So he said, that's all there is to it. Outside of the White House, Jewish supporters demonstrated. They feared that the United States was going to abandon partition and to support foreign rule under United Nations. All right, let me tell you what's going on here. So that vote passed in 1947, and all the surrounding countries were in an uproar. They didn't want it to happen. So the problem was Truman wasn't going to uphold the vote. He wasn't going to help them out. Israel had no might. They weren't really, you know, some Jews were in the land. They weren't a nation yet. And war had already really started in early 1948. So they needed Harry S. Truman, our president, to back them. So here's the story of it. It's amazing. It was vital to get President Truman to hold fast to the partition scheme. Dr. Sam Weitzman had been trying to get in all along, and I wouldn't let him in. But someone did come to see me, and he got in. This man with whom I was in business was Eddie Jacobson, one of the finest men I ever had anything to do with. He came in, he stood around, didn't say very much, was as quiet as he could be. And I finally said, Eddie, what in the world is the matter with you? Have you at last come to get something? Well, because you never have asked me for anything since I've been in the White House and since we've been friends. And then he told me that he thought that I ought not to keep Dr. Weitzman out of the White House. He thought I ought to see him. And I told him that I would see the doctor, but he'd have to bring him into the side door. I didn't want any propaganda started on the thing. There's Weissman. Dr. Weissman's first name was C-H-A-I-M. And I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I called him Cham. Called him that to his face, and he liked it. He was a wonderful man. One of the wisest people I think I ever met. We had a long, long conversation. And he explained the situation from his viewpoint. And I listened to him very carefully. And at the same time, I sent for Eddie Jacobson, and they both sat down and talked to me for a long, long time. When we were through, I said, all right, you two Jews have put it over on me, and I'm glad you have. After President Truman's meeting with Weizmann, the UN Security Council convened with trusteeship still on the agenda. Temporary trusteeship for Palestine should be a... Okay, so I don't know if you guys can hear that that well, but it worked. Truman would not see Weissman. Weissman is Psalm 47.9, the people of Abraham. He wouldn't even see him. So his Jewish lifelong friend who never asked Truman for anything, never asked him for nothing, is in the White House, and I'm going to retell the story in case you didn't see it. He was quiet, and he said, all right, what's bothering you? What, what, are you finally going to ask me for something? You've never asked me for anything since I've been president. He said, I think you should see Dr. Weissman. So his name is Haim, Jewish name, C-H-A-M. He didn't know how to pronounce it. He called him Cham. <laughs> So he called him Cham. He listened to the story. This is God's Jewish man, Dr. Weissman, turning the tables for the Jews. This is how God worked through him. And God put it right in there. Praise God. All right, here we go. Psalm 48. This is the mother load. This is 1948 when we know Israel for a fact became a nation. All right. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. 
beautiful for elevation, the Lord of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. For lo, the kings were assembled and they passed by together. They saw it, they marveled, they were troubled, and they hasted away. Fear took hold upon them there and pain as a woman of in travail. You break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. Uh. As we have heard, so have we seen. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God. God will establish it forever, Selah. We have thought of your loving kindness, O God, in the midst of your temple, according to your name, O God. So is the praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Look at this. Walk about Zion. Walk about Zion and go round about her. Count the towers thereof. Mark you well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that you may tell it to the generation following. The last generation. This is the last generation, the fig tree generation, before the day of the Lord comes. And of course, the rapture before that. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. Praise God in heaven. Now, let me just give you the final little... Well, you, you guys have seen Ben-Gurion make the speech before. Today, the state of Israel is born. Praise God. All right, listen to this. God knew the war was coming. So we led all the way up into this point. And what happened? Seven different nations the very next day declared war against Israel. Do you know what Israel started that war with? Three Sherman tanks. That's it. That's it. Egypt had an air force. Uh, they called it Transjordan then, before it was just Jordan. Transjordan had an air force. This was against all odds. There's no way the Jews could have survived this. Okay, I wanted to do this real quick, and then we'll get back into 48. But I want you to see something now. I'll, I'll just start with um, like Psalm 39. They said, Lord, make me to know my end, the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. They said, let me know when I'm going to die, Lord. How many days do I have left? The war starting, the Holocaust starting, the whole thing. Psalm 40, I waited patiently. These are all verse ones I'm going to do now. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined my inclined to me and heard my cry. So I'm thinking some of them escaped. Verse 41, or Psalm 41, verse 1. Blessed is he that considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. So I think that's a reference to people that would help the Jews escape because, you know, a lot of them escaped. Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after you, O God. Psalm 43, verse 1. Judge me, O God. Plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Psalm 44, we have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work you did in their day in times of old. You know, can't you help us, Lord? Verse Psalm 45, verse 1, my heart is overflowing of a good matter. I'm hearing that the war might be coming to an end. 
I speak of the things which I made, touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. So he got him out of it. The war stopped. This is 1946. Look at 47. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. Things are looking up. The vote happens in 1947. And now they get to walk about Zion in, in 1948. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Where? In the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. And again, God said, walk about her. They couldn't walk about her till they got in there. So think about that. Praise God. Now listen, Psalm 48, verse 5. I'm going to contrast this with Psalm 47, verse 9. That says, the princes, the rulers, the rulers of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. So think about it. God's talking about the United Nations meeting. They gathered together, they made a vote, and it passed. Went in Israel's favor. God's controlling all of it. Look at verse 5 of 48, the next year. Or four, I'll start with four. For lo, the kings, the kings were assembled. That's the, the nations coming against them. They passed by together. They saw it. Are the Jews really back in their land? What's going on here? And so they marveled, couldn't believe it. They were troubled and they hasted away. They had to see it with their own eyes. They came in, they looked. I can't believe the Jews are flooding back into their own land now. It's official, 1948. They hasted away. Verse six, fear took hold upon them there and pain as of a woman in travail. Enter I'm telling you, I believe this 100%. The Davidka, the Davidka, in, Google it. Please Google this. You, you guys got to look this stuff up. The Davidka has its own big monument in Israel. The weapon called the Davidka is mounted to the big stone monument. It's called the Davidka. The guy who invented it, his name, his name was David, um, whatever, Lebowski, Leibowitz, something like that. <laughs> I forgot his last name. But that's why they called it the Davidka. Listen to this. The Davidka had a spectacularly loud explosion that demoralized the enemy. It was a homemade, it was a homemade bomb, a homemade Israeli mortar that scared away the soldiers. They thought because it was so loud that it was atomic weapons. The Arabs abandoned many strongholds during the war as a direct result of this visceral fear. They knew that Albert Einstein, Oppenheimer, Weissman were designers of the atomic bomb and they thought that this was an atomic bomb that was going to blow them to smithereens. Okay, so in the documentary, if you can find it, I didn't find it on this one, but I'm telling you, look it up. It's called the Davidka. They blew the, it, it, sometimes they said it went backwards it had no range. You couldn't point it at anybody. It was unreliable. It was mostly ineffective, but it was loud as can be. It was so loud, it spooked the enemy. So I, I, I searched, I, I would have played it for you. I couldn't find the documentary that I watched probably, what, four months ago now, maybe longer. 
I tried to find it. The Davidka. D-A-V-I-D-K-A. -A, the Davidka. K-A on the end. So, but the original documentary that I saw, the Israeli soldier is recounting when they blasted it. And this is what he said. I'm telling you 100%, when we get to heaven, you'll know this is true. The, the enemy put their hands under their thighs. They were scared to death and they ran. They left their strongholds and they ran because this Jewish guy invented the Davidka. Means little David, made by David. Amen, brother. Listen, God put it in here. It's Psalm 48, verse 6. When I saw this months ago, I jumped out of my chair. I made a video on it. My, my regular family in here, they'll remember that. Fear took hold upon them there and pain as of travail, as a woman in travail. So when I looked up all those words in the Hebrew, a woman in travail put her hands under her thighs as she was having a baby. It's literally the position, listen, that the guy on the documentary said. The guy on the documentary said that. So he, he doesn't even know about Psalm 48. He's not quoting Psalm 48. He was just telling the story. So when I was studying this and matching it all up, I'm like, Lord, you put the result of the Davidka in the Bible 2,800 years ago. Oh, praise God. I hope you get that. And they listen, I didn't even know they had a monument for it. The monument is up there in stone, the Davidka. They got they got a real Davidka on uh, you know, bolted to the stone monument. This is amazing, I'm telling you. Fear to, and look at it, it's right after the line. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. This is, you know, all the Egyptian kings, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, all the nations that came against them. They saw it and they marveled. They were troubled. They hasted away. Then they came back because they regrouped and started the war. Fear took hold upon them there and pain as a, of, of a woman in travail. That they were trembling is what it means. So praise God. And listen, even down here, when God said, walk about Zion, check it out. Walk about Zion. You're here. I got you back in the land. This is a huge prophecy fulfilled. And go round about her, count the towers thereof. That could have been a hint from God saying, listen, I know you got back into the land May 14th, 1948. But May 15th, 1948, you're going to be in a war. So there was 29,000 able-bodied Jews that were the army. They weren't military. They were regular people, citizens. They called them able-bodied Jews. You got to look at the Psalm 48 or the 1948 Arab Israeli War, the War of Liberation. You've got to watch a documentary on that. And listen, I'm going to be honest. This is why I wanted to do this in two parts tonight. Because after this study tonight, I want you guys to watch the documentaries. I'll come back Tuesday night and I'll do the Psalms of Ascent and it'll be all rapture, uh, millennium talk. And we'll get it done. But you got to know the stories of God. I, I guarantee God wants you to know how miraculously he delivered Israel. So again, it's not just, oh, God brought the Jews back in 1948. That was prophecy fulfilled. End of story. No, you got to look into it. It's amazing. I declare the end from the beginning. Praise God. So anyway, that one blew me away. And look at, count the towers, and then the lat in the 13th verse, that you may tell it to the generation following. Now listen, I got to tie this in. Remember Psalm 45? He said, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So he was ready to tell the story. It's the same word as Psalm 48, 13. Tell it to the last generation. So there to know the goodness and greatness of God. 
Dude, pre-trib is all over the Bible. I will show you pre-trib all over on the next study. You're completely wrong if you think Jesus is going to send us through. You cannot think that. You are, you're not arguing with me. You're arguing with God in the Bible. All right, let me just do this real quick because it's worth it. Tel Aviv, on May the 14th, 1948, was a day of which all future Jewish generations would never cease to speak and dream, the day of Israel's birth. Undaunted by the ominous reports of the massing of the enemy armies, the 37th David ben -Gurion, with David Ben Gurion, David Ben first prime minister, gathered in the museum of Tel Aviv, Heim Weissman, the first president. Forever. In Jewish history. There's Golda Meir. She was prime we minister in the late 60s. It was very important for us to prevent the General Assembly from taking a decision before 6 o'clock, which might preempt our declaration of independence. At the United Nations, the Arab state... So I don't know if you caught that. They wanted to announce that they were a state. They wanted to make the official announcement before the United Nations messed it up and said, hey... Uh, a war's been declared. We're going to have to put the announcement on hold. That's kind of what that was about. So making a last-ditch attempt to force a resolution that will stop the creation of the Jewish state. If by 6 o'clock we cannot arrive into at any conclusion, the war game is up. In Tel Aviv, it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, one hour before the Sabbath. It was the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate like all other nations in their own sovereign state, which would open the gates of the home, land, the homeland wide to every Jew. Privileged member of the community of nations. By virtue of our natural and historic right and on the strength of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. I don't know if you guys can read that or not. There they are. In the midst of diplomacy at the UN and the rumbling of imminent war in the Near East, the fate of the Jewish nation prophecy now lies in the fulfilled. Hands of President Truman. United States recognition of the state of Israel is the Jewish nation's only hope for independence. At 11 minutes past six, Ambassador Philip Jessup of the United States delegation rose to the rostrum. This government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. Look at these people. The United States recognized them. That was a big deal. That really kind of made it official. This is God's amazing prophecy, people. He scattered them for 2,000 years and he brought them back. This is the culmination of it. Israel's defenders had no illusions about the perils that they would face. Israel knew the fear of death and the taste of birth in the same moment. Israel knew the fear of death and the taste of birth in the same moment. That's what he just said. <laughs> yep. Now you got Uncle Grandpa Joe Biden blubbering at the wheel. Listen, all glory to God. I'm telling you, the Psalms match up with the years. And I want to say this. It's not always perfect. Part of the mystery is 
Is it a look ahead? Is it a look back? Or did it match up exactly with the year? So this was a lot of matching up exactly with the year. So, all right, Psalm 49, praise God, let's go. Look at this. So we just watched it. Israel becomes a nation, right? All of it, they go to war. You've got to watch the documentary, amen. And now they're in the war, you watch that. But this is 1949. This is after God miraculously won the war. So this is Psalm 49, 1949. Here is the greatest mystery of our time, one of them for sure. Let me make sure I got... Look at this. Hear this, 49 verse 1. Hear this, all you people. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the world. Look at God. He's making an announcement to the world after what he just did. Hear this, all you people. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding, meaning I want you to understand my wisdom. Now get verse four. Here's the here's the the banger of all this is the mother load. <laughs> I will incline my ear to a parable. I will open my dark sayings upon the harp. Okay? So we we know the second part because we know the word dark sayings. But listen, I, I want to give this to you differently. I will incline my ear to a parable. That doesn't make sense. God's not inclining his ear to a parable. So I wish the English was better. So I looked up all the words and I'm going to give you what it's really saying, okay? <laughs> and then and then we're going to break it down. Okay? So th this is what God is really saying. I God have extended an offer and will uncover your ears to a truth in a parable, in a in a story. I will open wide my riddles in the Psalms. That's what he's saying. That's what verse 4 is. I, God, have extended an offer and will uncover your ears to a truth in a parable, and I will open wide my riddles in the Psalms. What riddles? The rapture, tribulation, the day of the Lord, antichrist, uh, millennial the millennial kingdom, the millennial temple, um, modern times, what's going on in our world. Nine, what do you got there? Nine fifteen, nine sixteen. Oh, this year. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But listen to this. I'm going to break this down. Let me just make sure I got this. Oh, and the rest of Psalm 49, I won't read it for this study, but it's all tribulation talk. It's all tribulation talk. Okay, now look at this. I will incline my ear to a parable, okay? The word incline stay with me, means stretch forth, stretch forth, think, shoot forth. Parable of the fig tree, Jesus said, behold, when you see the fig tree, when it shooteth forth. So think that. I'm telling you, this is the start of the parable of the fig tree. The war is over, they're back in. This is 1949. God said, hear this, all you people, all you inhabitants of the world. I'm going to give you a riddle. 
The word enigma means to be guessed at. All right, I got ahead of myself. I will incline. Incline, see, I don't even like that word. It means stretch forth. It means an offer. It means to extend an offer. So he says, I will extend an offer, but look what it says. I will incline my ear. My ear means the ear of the audience. That's what the word means, to uncover the ear of the audience. So God is saying, I'm going to stretch forth and offer you to uncover your ears. Can you get this? I'm going to uncover your ears, God Almighty. Remember the verse we started off with. Jesus opened up all the scriptures. He opened up their understanding. God can open up our understanding. So mine ear means uncover the ear of his audience to a parable. A parable, a metaphorical in nature truth, a proverb, a story. That's what it means. And listen, mine ear, I'm telling you, please look up the word mine ear in the Hebrew. It's one word. It means a receiver of divine revelation. It means to reveal, to uncover the ear. All right? And listen, I'm going to give you another example of the usage of the exact same word that's translated mine ear. Ear. And, and again, I don't like that translation. Isaiah 22, 14. It's the same word, the exact same word. Look what this verse says. And it was revealed in my ears by the Lord of hosts. Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, says the Lord God of hosts. What's what's the word? It was revealed in my ears. The word is revealed. That's the word, to reveal. So mine ear is revealed in my ear. So God gave him revelation in the ear of Isaiah. So that's literally what it means. I will incline my ear. I will stretch forth and offer you to uncover your ears a mystery and a parable. I will, now listen, the second part, I will open my dark sayings upon the harp. I will open means throw open, open wide. Dark sayings, we already covered this. It means enigma. It means riddle. And in the definition, it's a riddle to be guessed at. So think about that for a second. If God's given us a riddle, we're supposed to guess at it. We're supposed to try to figure out the riddle. The riddle is, we're in the last generation. What does God have for us in the final rep generation? Well, we know the rapture. We know what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. All these things got to be fulfilled before that generation passes away. Listen, you guys, I never gave up on the fig tree. A lot of people gave up on the fig tree because they started it at 1948. And when you add 80 years to 1948, it comes to 2028. When you take that extra year, okay, it can't go to 81, but we can use the whole extra year minus one day. That's 2029. We're still here in 2023. It doesn't make sense. People gave up on it. The fig tree started in 1949, now at 81, and it comes to 2030. This is why the C.J. Lovick can't be right. It's not 2024 to 2031. And listen, I should give you what I just learned. I just put something together. I'll probably finish. I'll finish this study off with that. Praise God. I will open wide, throw open my riddles. I'm going to throw it open wide. And the harp, listen, the harp just means harp. David excelled at playing the harp. That's in the definition of harp. So they played the harp when they sang the Psalms. So God said, I'm opening wide my riddles to be guessed at 
in my psalms. That's what it means. All right, praise God. Let's go to Psalm 50. And I'm going to prove to you right in verse 1 that the fig tree started in 1949, Psalm 49, because a lot of people want to push it back to Psalm 50 now. But look what it says. All gold from our Father in heaven. Look what it says. Psalm 50. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken. This is rich. This is gold. Think about it. What do you mean, has spoken? His big announcement in Psalm 49. Hear this, all you inhabitants of the world. And he made the announcement. He declared his mysteries to be solved, to be guessed at. I'm telling you, this is perfect. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof. Flat earthers, they got the sun going like this. The sun goes down and rises because it goes around the basketball. Praise God, let's go. <laughs> Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. Look at this. This is Psalm 50. 1950, the Jews are still just getting going. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof. Out of Zion, where? Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. Look what he did against all. All odds, people hated the Jews. Six million kills, dry bones, dust to the earth. He rose them up and gave them a nation in spite of all that. I am telling you, it's miraculous what God did. He has shined. Verse three, our God shall come and shall not keep silence. Really? What's the coming of God? Look what it says. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very temptuous round about him. He shall, look, look at this, this is rapture, people. This was a nugget to me. I, I looked at this before, and I don't think I ever got it. He shall call to the heavens from above. He, he's above, the heavens are above. Think about it. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Well, what's the call? The dead in Christ are in heaven. He calls to the heaven and to the earth so he can judge his people. Look at verse five. Gather my saints. These words are in red, by the way. This is the first time it turns red. Gather my saints together to me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Is anybody with me? Look at this. That is the rapture in Psalm 50. So if the post-tribber is still in here, look at that. He's going to call to the heavens from above. The dead in Christ will come with Christ. And to the earth that he may judge his people. Well, what does that really mean rapture? Look at the next verse. Gather my saints, my saints, my godly ones together. Where? To me, to me. We meet Christ in the air. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend with a shout to meet him in the air. We're meeting him. This is it. It was right here the whole time. I missed it. Gather my saints together to me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Think about this. Whose sacrifice? Not ours. Not ours. Jesus' sacrifice. We made a covenant with the sacrifice of Christ. That's the covenant. It's the new covenant. And God's got it right here. Look at verse 6. <laughs> And the heavens shall declare, 
That's us because we're up in heaven now. And the heaven shall declare his righteousness. For God is judge himself. Selah. Now look at verse 7. Tell me this isn't what it means. Hear, O my people. Still words in red. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. Who? O Israel. Back to Israel. This is, I'm telling you, God is so good. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. See, he was talking to us. We're the saints. This is Israel. I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, even your God. Why is God talking in 1950 that he's going to testify against Israel? When he testifies against Israel, he's talking about the day of the Lord. Now, if you look at it in context, verses 4, 5, and 6, we were raptured. He gathered his saints to him. Now, he's shifting back right with the story. I'm going to testify against you, O Israel. I will testify against you. I am God, even your God. I will, and again, remember I read this in the beginning. I'm not going to reprove you for your sacrifices or your burned offerings to have been continually before me. It's not because you're not killing animals. You are killing animals, but you don't get the point of it. That's why he's going to do it. So look at verse 14. No, 13. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Question mark. God's like, I don't want animals. I want this. Verse 14. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of your trouble. Jacob's trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. When is the Jews ever glorified him? They're going to at the end when they finally believe in the son, the son that he sent for them and they rejected him, but he's going to reach his hand out a second time and they will believe in him on the day of atonement, Zechariah 12, 10. Now look at this, look at this. So that's verse 15. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Verse 16, Psalm 50, the, the story continues. But to the wicked, now God's talking to the wicked, but to the wicked, God says, what have you to do to declare my statutes or that you should take my covenant in your mouth? God's like, what are you doing even talking about stuff that pertains to me? Seeing you hate instruction and cast my word behind you. When you saw a thief, then you, you consented with him and have been partaker with the adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. And this could be the separation of the two-thirds Jews and the one-third that will be a remnant. I just thought of that. that. That's what that could be. These things have you done, and I kept silence. You thought that I was altogether such as one like yourself, but I will reprove you and set them in order before your eyes. God talking. Now consider this. You that forgot God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Whoso offers praise glorifies me. And to him that orders his conversation, orders his way aright, will I show the salvation of God. So God even puts the warning in at the end. If you do it right, I will show you my salvation. Dear Lord, this is all good stuff. Now listen, I got to match this up with Matthew 24, 51. So look what I just read. 22, Psalm 50, 22 says, God said, now consider this, you that forgot God, 
lest I tear you in pieces. This is the end of the tribulation. Matthew 24, verse 51. Look, when you see stuff like that, tear in pieces, that triggers my brain. It's the last verse in Matthew 24. Look what it says. I'll read the one before. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him, and in an hour that he's not aware of him, and shall cut him asunder, cut him in pieces, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you see how that matches up? Oh, praise God. All glory to God. I'm telling you, the Lord is incredible. So look at, we found another rapture verse in Psalm 50, 4, 5, and 6. Praise God. Let's go. All right, listen, and, and this at this time, I was going to do all the Psalms of Ascent, 120 to 134. I'll do it Tuesday night, so it won't be long. But please, listen to me. I want you guys to think about this study. Watch the documentaries on the, on the War of 1948. Look what God did. Let it sink in your soul. We're about to be raptured. We're going to know everything. I can tell you right now. We're going to know everything, but let's learn it now while God loves us learning this stuff. He loves it, absolutely loves it. And listen, I'm telling you, when I do the Psalms of Ascent, you will see that the fig tree did start in 1949. Everything's in place. Listen, God bless C.J. Lovick for Rock Island Books. I love the guy. He's got great videos. He's had unbelievable revelations. We don't have anything against that man. I think, listen, he says he found a jubilee in 2023. What better year than a jubilee the first time it's ever celebrated for the rapture? Doesn't that make sense? There's no fulfillment of a jubilee in the whole Bible. So if he thinks the jubilee year is 2023, that's a perfect time for a rapture. Perfect time. So I think he proved the rapture. He just thinks the tribulation starting in 2024. So that would be the one part where I would say it's wrong. And he can be off by a year. I mean, listen, he's doing the whole calendar from day one of creation till the end. That's hard to do. So God bless him that he even came up with what he did. But look at, I'm telling you, when you learn the Psalms of Ascent, you'll see 2028, 2029, 2030, 2031, 2032, 2033, 2034. You'll see it all. And listen, I'll give you this little tidbit. Listen, if we get raptured next month, the Psalms of Ascent start in Psalm 120. So think about it. Three and a half years, almost exactly. We're in the six months, six month of God's calendar. So from 2020, it's been three and a half years. So three and a half, add it up, three and a half, seven year tribulation, 10 and a half, three and a half years more equals 14. The Psalms of Ascent have 15 Psalms. Stay with me. This is a nugget. So the 15th year is 2034. Psalm 134 is when we're in the new millennial temple, praising God for the wedding feast of the Lamb. So listen, the 15th Psalm of Ascent means we made it. That's the goal. The Psalm of Ascent is to make it. So the new temple is going to be on a high mountain in Jerusalem. God's going to rearrange. Listen, Revelation 16, he's going to rearrange the mountains. The temple will be built upon that mountain. And listen, in that 15th year, we will walk up that temple. And I don't know if we'll walk. We'll have glorified bodies. We could just appear there. <laughs> But we will go up that mountain to that temple. It says at night in Psalm 134. And we will be praising God. Now listen to me. 
The Psalms of Ascent are like feast days. They're holy convocations. They're dress rehearsals. We're supposed to sing these songs until they're literally fulfilled. Do you understand? This is all being fulfilled. Everything will be fulfilled. So on the 15th year of the Psalm of Ascent, the real year started in 2020. It ends in 2034. It probably takes us three and a half years to build the temple. It just God's not just going to snap his fingers. He's going to do it the proper way. Praise God. So that thought hit me today that it'll be fulfilled in, in the 15th year. So it's perfect. Listen, three and a half years were raptured. Seven year tribulation, 10 and a half. Three and a half years to 2034, that's a perfect 14. The 15th, which by the way is 555, triple grace, right? Triple grace, the 15th, we'll be fulfilling it. We'll be there. We'll literally be there in the temple and we are the bride. It's our wedding. It's our wedding feast. Oh, praise God. So look, at I knew this was going to be long, and we're going to do that one Tuesday. Tuesday night, don't miss that one. It'll post if you do. We're going to do the Psalms of Ascent, and we're going to take little gold rush trails off to the side because there's a little extra juice in there. So listen, his name is Frank Marco, M-A-R-K-O-W, is the documentaries that I showed you tonight. He's got like nine parts. I didn't even watch all nine parts. I think I watched three of them. The first two were gold. I don't know what the other ones are. I think it's later in the 1950s and 60s. But um, listen, this is an amazing thing. The Jews coming back is amazing, okay? We can't just write it off as, oh yeah, that was fulfilled. There's a huge story to it, so... Look, I don't know if I did that justice. I mean, there's a lot more I could have dug out, but praise God, I tried to hit the real points that you can see it really does match up with the years. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. And, and look, at that study for Tuesday is mostly done. So I'll go over it and see if God adds anything to it, but it's mostly done. So Praise God, we'll get it done on Tuesday night. And listen, we're going to be raptured. It's coming. I, I know it's coming. This world's on fire. This world is so evil. Every day adding up. Everything they're doing to us is all on schedule for tribulation. All of it. All right. Praise God. I think I got it all. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. <laughs> I can't wait to drink heavenly water. This water makes my mouth dry. It drives me nuts. Amen, you guys. God bless. Look, did that make sense? Did you guys like see it? Did you really see it? I don't want you just to go along with it and say, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. I wanted you to see that. I wanted you to see it. Telling the glory of God is what I tried to do. It's in those Psalms. Reread those Psalms. Look, it's a great it's a great read, even though it was horrors for the Jews. But if you start with Psalm 38 and read right up to 50, Psalm 50, um, it's amazing. And look, even 51 had tribulation talk in it. I kept going and it took a little bit for God to change the subject. Amen. I just truly wanted you to understand it. I wanted you to say to yourself, that does make sense. Wow, God really did match up these years with the Psalms, which is an incredible supernatural thing. I mean, think about it. 150 Psalms. Ezra probably organized them. God had to control him to make it all perfect and part of God's plan. Amen. Purple Panda, praise God. All glory to God. So, look, at you. I always sweat these out. You guys keep praying for me. I'm taking all the prayers. So, if I pop into your head and say a prayer for me, I'm telling you God answers them, and I'm thankful for them. So, thank you for your prayers, truly. 
Oh, so what's, I can't, I don't even know, 60 minutes and an hour, 120, so this is about two and a half hours-ish. Amen, amen. And look, I always, when I first became a Christian, I always, uh, Fran Chider, we lift you up right now in Jesus' name. Praise God, amen. Bless her, Lord. Yeah, Psalm 127.1, that's, I told you Solomon only wrote two Psalms. That's the one he wrote, talking about the temple. Solomon is the one who built the temple for God. God's got everything covered. It all matches up. God has done an amazing work in his word. Oh, this book is the best. It's just, it's so fascinating to me. And listen, we still got a little bit of time before this rapture. I don't even know what direction God's going to bring me in. I do got a couple more ideas for a couple more lives, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know if we'll even get any more new stuff coming. Pups are doing good. They're passed out. Look, I, I got a story for the pups last night. So look, I was studying, putting this together. So I do, I do the initial study. It takes me 10 hours to write it all down. And then the next day, I'll look at it and I go through it to like, you know, it's weird. When you do a study like this, if I go into the world and do the grandkids and do all that, I lose my train of thought. So I got to look at the notes and get back in my train of thought. It, it's a process with me. It's probably easier for some people. It's not for me. So I re-go over it. So last night, I'm going over it. So I was tired in the chair. I said, Lord, let's go. I got to get this done. 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock. I carved myself out three hours. I said, I can tighten this up in three hours. So God's blessing me. The Psalm 50. I'm doing it. It all looks good. I forgot about my dogs. It was pouring rain. And I didn't know if they were in or out. I couldn't remember. They go in and out so much. I went out there, clapped my hands, got them to come. They were drenched, soaking wet trying to get the rabbits under the shed. They dug a hole. They got in there. I don't think they got any rabbits. They were mud, mud, just head to toe. And I'm telling you, it didn't even bother me. I got the bucket. I got the towels. And I, I let them stay out 20 more minutes. They were pumped. So, uh, yeah, but they're getting old now. So I was happy because it was like their youth again. They haven't done that in a while. So that's a dog story. So they were soaking wet. I had to clean them all up, do the whole thing. But anyway, I think it was tribulation training so they can get ready to eat people. Revelation 6, 8. Did Sister Rachel make it in tonight? I don't, I don't know if I've seen her. <laughs> Ruru, Ruru and Boo Boo were, they were almost in trouble. Then I said, look at you guys, you're young again. <laughs> I didn't see her, so just you and Steve were the moderators. Dude, I'm, I'm thankful that the moderator thing just carried over. So that was good. Yep, vic victorious a war, got into the United Nations. And it shot forth. Oh, I was going to give you that. I'm going to save it. I'll save it. Listen, it's, I've said it before to my regular family study group, but it, it even got added to a little bit. Amen, sister. Praise God. What, what was up with D23? What, uh, what's the beef? He's saying no rapture or just he's not a Christian, period. <laughs> amen, mud dog, amen. God bless. Pretty soon it's going to be oh, arguing over dates. 
Yeah, look, at, I, I'm not even, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not fixated on September 11th. Listen, I say September 11th because that's a Lule 25. At the end of the summer, it makes sense, the summer fruit harvest. So <laughs> that's that's why I say that date. It could be any date in there. So I am not hung up on the date. I'm telling you, we're going. The rapture of the church is going to happen. And it's going to freak us all out. And then we're not going to be freaked out because we're going to have glorified bodies and we're going to be one with Almighty God. Ephesians 3.19, the fullness of God will flow through us. Amen, brother. I saw that somewhere in there. End of the harvest, that's what it is. Question, fire away. Alexandria, we lift you up in Jesus' name. Lord, protect her, give her wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Dennis, God bless. Yeah, listen, keep telling your family about the rapture. How do they get beheaded? Listen, the beheadings won't happen until the second half. So you got to know that. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. Listen, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are going to be running loose while Satan's in the war with heaven. So I, I want to do a whole Satan video because just, you know, put it all in there. But the beheadings is when Revelation 14, the angel says, blessed are you who die from this point on. Why? Because the people that are beheaded by the guillotines will make it into the millennial kingdom. They'll rule and reign with us. The first tribulation saints, they're going to be up at the throne of God. They don't get to come back to the earth. So it, it's interesting. Listen, when we read the Bible as a Christian, we, we don't know any better at first, and we apply all of it to us. And you can't do that. God's got many groups of people. So when you divide it up properly, then you can interpret it properly. So God never said, rightly interpret the Bible. He said, rightly divide it. Divide who he's talking to, and then you can interpret it. So it's just a, it's such an amazing thing. Age of accountability, I do not know. And listen, listen to this. I forgot. You just reminded me of something. The Hitler youth, the Hitler youth, I felt something in my spirit. And I don't know. I, I never know if it's God. Sometimes I do, but mostly I always guess. I felt like the children question, are all children going to make it? Look what children are even capable of. Hitler youth, just fever pitch, foaming at the mouth. Don't know why, but they want to kill Jews and foul evil. So, yes, I'll explain the 81 year part. Um, ultimately, we won't be the very first fruits. We'll be like second of the first fruits. All right, so listen, Jesus said, listen, I'll answer you guys' questions, but I can only do them one at a time. That'll just be moments, the dead in Christ. That'll be moments because we meet them in the air, the Bible says. Together we'll be in the air. But the 81 years, Jesus said, all things have to be fulfilled before the generation passes away. So if you think about it, I'm 56 years old. September 28th, I'm still 56. September 29th, I'll turn 57. So I'm not 57 until that day. So if it's 80 years and 364 days, that still counts as the generation because a generation is 80 years. So does that make sense? So that's what it has to be. So or else we've gone over now. But the 1949 start is perfect. Listen, I, I think we will. I think we'll see graves burst open. I mean, how can we not? This is going to be literal. It's going to be literal. Um, I'm on Clapper if you want to get in there. If you go to Clapper, it's the same name 
and you can get on our family group, the Discord group. So Clapper's an app. It's like a bootleg TikTok. It's a crappy app, but it works for us that we can all hang out and do it. So <laughs> for skinny men. <laughs> Amen, amen. Look, I got a lot of my Clapper family that come over here and uh, join the live. Praise God. And look, we've been studying for a year and a half together. So I can't even remember all the revelations that we got, which stinks because I'd love to give them all. Kelly is working right now. God has blessed me in ways that I can't explain. And thanks to good people, good brother, and it's all worked out. And my wife has a really good job. So that worked out too. Yes, rapture for sure. I mean, this this is it. Well, since the TikTok days. Amen, mud dog, God bless you. Have a good evening. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you for hanging out. Yeah, yeah. And look, we learned. Are you a fellow Pagan? I don't even know what that means. Is that a misprint or a word I don't know? <laughs> Amen, Brenda. Praise God. The 80 years comes from Psalm 90, verse 10, the psalm that Moses wrote. And you know Moses is going to be a big player in the end times. I have personal, God's given me a few personal dreams in my life, for sure. Who inherits the earth? The Jews inherit the earth. We will inherit the earth. But the Jews, remember, this is one way you separate the Jews. They're, God calls them the earth dwellers. The Jews are all about the kingdom. We're the heavenly people. So it, we listen, when you're a new Christian, you don't know any better. You just think, oh, everybody's going to be glorified and everybody's going to heaven. God said he's creating a new heaven and a new earth. So think about it. There's got to be people on earth. So they're going to be the earthly people. I think, listen, I think in the end, there's going to be three groups of people. There's going to be glorified people that are one with God the Father and the Son, us. There's going to be the Old Testament saints that get risen from the dead and have eternal bodies, but not quite like us. And then I think there's going to be regular people that will reproduce for all eternity. So they'll be like Adam and Eve. It'll be eternal bodies. They won't die. There's no more death. It'll be eternal bodies. And listen, that's one of the reasons why the tree of life, the leaves will be for the healing of the nations. That's in Revelation 22. That's at the end. That's in the new Jerusalem. So listen, God's the creator. He doesn't want just one person, like one um, essence of people. He, he's got all kinds of stuff going on. So, praise God. The, you think the healing leaves are for the millennial reign? I think it was for after. I think it's in the New Jerusalem. So I, I'd have to double check that. Amen, Jen. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, well, e Enoch is kind of a representation of us. Elijah was raptured, but Elijah's going to come back and die in the tribulation. So Enoch will be like us, a person who never died. And remember, Enoch was pre-flood. Enoch was not a Jew. God chose Abraham to start the Hebrew people. So Enoch to come back in the tribulation doesn't even make sense. He wasn't a part of the line of redemption. John 6, 37 through 40. Those are possibly my favorite verses of all time. <laughs> Praise God. Off 
awful temple. Well, we're all awful temples. And that's just a fact. God has forgiven us. He's cleansed us with his blood of all our sins. So, listen, this this might sound crazy, but and don't twist it, but I'm telling you, when it comes to sin, God's already taken care of the problem. Does that make sense? God is not dwelling on our sin. We're not supposed to sin. It's not a license to sin. Oh, I'm forgiven. I'll just go do whatever I want. No, no, no. But I'm telling you, when we get bogged down by our sin, God's looking at us saying, I've already washed you of that. Now quit thinking about it. And when you do that and you lose kind of the guilt a little bit, you can function better. Believe it or not, you can sin less. When you're always in guilt and wallowing in your sin, you become no good to God. And that, that's the horrible part about it. Is that a question for me or somebody else? What if you were unsure a few months ago at the rapture? Man, why won't this thing stay with my finger on it? Yeah, listen, you can't be, <laughs> you can't be one of the 144,000. They're already up in heaven. They're going to come back down. So, and we'll see if I'm, I'm right on that. But I actually do think I am. Look at Sister Anna still in the house. Are you still in Hawaii? Amen. Praise God. We're about to be raptured. John 6. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of the Father. Look, I love this because 39 is the will of the Father for Christ. 40 is the will of the Father for us. How perfect is that? And this is the will, the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, nada, none, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And listen, there's four last days. That's why Jesus said this four times. So he said it four times and we're, we keep thinking, oh, last day, last day, last day. I think there's four last days. So Christ, his resurrection, I think was one. The rapture will be another end of the tribulation will be another and then the great white throne judgment will be a last day so i'm not dogmatic about that but the fact that he said it four times within 13 verses that god's given us a clue there given us a clue listen the 10 virgins is not for the church of the rapture that's my next video so I've got to dig it out, and hopefully I can even put it out before Tuesday's live. I'm going to try to do a full video on the 10 virgins and do it because, again, me and my family study group, we studied that out months ago, and it seemed like it was right. Amen, Cynthia. Yeah, the, the seventh day will be a thousand years long. But when Jesus said, I'll raise them up at the last day, raise them up at the last day, people rose in the resurrection of Christ. People will rise in the rapture. Old Testament saints will rise, Daniel 12, 2, at the end of tribulation. And then at the end, great white throne judgment, people will rise and people will go to hell. And then four last days will be complete. Uh, 
Um, I don't think the ten virgins are Israel, and I can explain to you why. Listen, I, I begged God to give me the definition of the ten virgins. My whole Christian life, 30 years, and look, my family in here can testify to that. I saw the Daniel study request. I'll have to pray about that and think about it. You know, not that I don't want to do it, but just time-wise, whatever. But anyway, I prayed to God for the for the meaning of the parable of the ten virgins, and I think I pretty much got it. It wasn't a crazy ding, 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 but it kind of was. So, but but here's the thing. It can't be Israel because they're already married. So think about that. Israel's already married. They're, they're a harlot. They played the adulterer. God's given them a bill of divorce. They're not a virgin. The very definition of a virgin is, is un married daughter look it up in the greek that's exactly what it means unmarried daughter the jews they're already married us we're already married so think about that 10 virgins why is it 10 because there's going to be 10 kings under the reign of antichrist so they're going to split this world up into 10 regions and you know who these people are? These are people that don't have a, a God. They don't have a God. They're unmarried virgins, unmarried daughters. So they don't have an affiliation. Now, how many people do you know on this earth right now that say, oh, I don't want nothing to do with religion. I, I don't have a religion. I'm not Muslim. I'm not Christian. I'm not Catholic. I'm nothing. Those people are all over the planet. They're all over the planet. So think about that. They do not have an affiliation to a God. But Revelation 3.10 says the whole world is going to be tested. The test is God's going to draw the line in the sand and he's going to say, you either worship the devil and his seed or you worship me. There's going to be no in between. There's going to be no Hindu and, you know, all these other false religions. It's going to be God or the devil. Praise God. So that, that opened up my eyes to the parable of the ten virgins. Plus, think about this. Think about this. What do people say about the parable of the ten virgins? What do they say? They say, Keep the oil in your lamp. Keep the oil in your lamp. I mean, think about what that means. That means you're keeping your own salvation. How can you do that? You got to keep oil in your lamp or you're not saved. You're a foolish virgin and you don't make it. That doesn't make sense. That means we're keeping our own salvation. So you can't keep oil in your lamp. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. Well, you can't buy the Holy Spirit and you can't you know, keep the oil of the Holy Spirit in you. So it doesn't make sense. And that's why I never knew what the parable meant. I kept thinking, what does this mean? The oil, listen, the oil, spoiler alert, is the word of God. The word of God is the oil. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, a light unto thy path. The word is the oil that gives the light. So in the tribulation, your life will be put on the line. So are you going to die for Christ? Are you, or do you mean business? It's going to be all tested. And without the word, without that word, you're not going to know anything. Amen, Nick. Amen. Amen. Memorizing scripture is great. Look, look, I said earlier, we learn all these secular songs and you know, whatever. I wish I could have memorized the, the Psalms, the songs of God like that. It would be amazing. I did not see your prayer about praying for someone.
Amen. Look, it'll be tough too because tribulation ain't going to be no joke. Oh, it's going to be horrible. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's a good question right there. The fullness of the Gentiles. I actually think that's probably the rapture, but that is a good question. I mean, I've always looked at it as the fullness of the Gentiles, Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent his son into the world. So attached to that word fullness, you know what I mean? Yeah, we'll we'll have a double resting place for sure. We're we're the firstborn of Mother Jerusalem. We're the firstborn. We break the womb. So you guys watch those videos. We're breaking the womb. We're getting the double inheritance. It, it's it's gonna be amazing. Psalm twenty seven about the rapture. I might have heard that somewhere. I'll, I'll have to look study that up when I can concentrate on it. Yeah, when the church age ends, I, that, I'm saying that too, Nick. And that's what I've always understood. But the fact that it even got questioned was kind of interesting. But it, it has to mean that. Because in the tribulation, it's a free-for-all. God turns his attention to Israel. So the fullness of the Gentiles really does have to be the church age. Man, I, I don't know what I can do about this thread, you guys. I'm trying to read the long ones, and it zips right away, and then my finger don't even let me hold it. Yep, yeah, Isaiah 26, 19. I mean, look, I, I always thought that was a rapture verse. I mean, it, it gets a little tricky. It could be a remnant verse, like hide in the cave type thing. Raptures, Ephesians 1, 10 for sure. Psalm 123 is 2023, yep. And listen, I, I'm gonna, I'll let the cat out of the bag for Tuesday. The rapture is in Psalm 122, and we're in 123. So God did a little warning of its coming. So again, it's all part of the mystery, all part of the enigma. You gotta dig it out. Listen, Psalm 123 only has four verses and basically says, we've been left behind. Have mercy on us, Lord. O oh, you that dwell in the heavens. So it's perfect. And, and that's why it can't, we can't wait another year. If we wait another year, you've got to bump every single Psalm, every single one. Now that's, the, that's not God's pattern. So to bump it all is not God's pattern. Well, yeah, Psalm, Psalm 123 is about the evil elite, the proud people hating the Jews. Why? Because the Jews just got a covenant that they can rebuild their temple. So that, that's what's going to be going on there. Uh, Tuesday, probably same time, 8 p.m. I mean, I usually go at 9 p.m. for my regular lives, but... I don't know. I just picked eight for some reason for YouTube. So I, I don't even know if nine would work better or what. Brother Greg still in the house. How you doing, brother? You holding up? What's going on with the health? Uh, Psalm 124, good question. I think that might be Psalm 83. I, I really chewed on that. It, it could be the Ezekiel War, but I think the Ezekiel 38 War has to be after Psalm 83. So it, it could be a combination of both. Um, Psalm 126 says, All the nations, the heathen, say, Wow, look what the Lord has done for them. <laughs> Remember, at the midway point of the tribulation, the Jews are going to be running the world. All the other big nations are going to be decimated. So the Jews will be like the number one superpower of the world. And then two-thirds of them will worship the Antichrist, which will 
infuriate the Lord. And then you got great tribulation where Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, run, get out of there, run. So I think the initial remnant, I'm still trying to decipher this. The initial remnant is going to be added to during the tribulation, like the ones that escaped the abomination of desolation. So it's all fascinating. Like, I mean, I wish I could really nail down all the timing of all of it, but it's it's hard to do. So a lot of it is educating guesswork. Oh man, brother, that ain't good. You had to move, move into the parents because of you or helping them out. Man, praise God for doing that, bro. Amen. I will amen to those prayers. I didn't fully see it, but praise God. God knows. We lift everybody up here that needs you, brother Greg and his family. We got to get to the end, brother. Lift you up in Jesus' name. Do a miracle, God. Do a miracle in brother Greg's family. Bless that whole family. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, please. Let it be an actual miracle, Lord. And everybody else in here that needs prayer, we lift you up. The child is us. Revelation 12, 5. We are the man child. Same as Isaiah 66, 7. Same thing. Amen. God's helper. Praise God. I love it. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good, peeps. We just got to get to the end. I love you too, brother. I really do. God bless you. And we got to get you back into the group. It's up to you if you want to, but we need you back in there and get the fellowship going. So we will get that done. Amen. Lux's sister, Corinne. God bless you, sister. Always good to see you. Praise the Lord. Love the name. <laughs> You guys coming in on the YouTube, incognito, my regular fam. <laughs> Amen. Quick saying, God bless. Listen, this is the greatest time in all of history. The greatest, just unbelievable. Oh, I mean, how, how do we even get to be alive at the end? I <laughs> mean, it's amazing alive and saved so not only are we here god saved us opened our eyes we're getting mysteries amen maximus praise god corinne is lux l-u-x last we're the last of the last generation <laughs> Amen. We we are the man child. Listen, the man child is caught up to the throne of God. Jesus wasn't caught up as a child. Jesus ascended in power. He was not being raptured, right? Rapture means snatched away from danger. Jesus ascended. He ascended up in the clouds in glory. And if you read the very end of the book of Luke, the disciples were thrilled. They were thrilled. They went back praising God every day in the temple. So that was all joy. So Jesus was not caught up as a child. Oh yeah, backwards from Revelation is the 48th book. I forgot about that. Amen, George. Praise God. Excellent, excellent. Backwards from Revelation, it's the 48th book. 1948. Look at that. Come on. All glory to God. Love that. And I remember hearing that maybe once or twice, never stuck in the bank. So praise God for saying that. <laughs> Amen, Mr. Mister. <laughs> 
Look, I got I got kicked off of TikTok for people turning me in with false information. They permanently banned me, no rhyme or reason. I still can't get on TikTok today. I mean, maybe I could if I tried to weasel my way in with a different name or whatever, which, you know, I can't do it from my phone because my phone's recognized and whatever. So I just went to Clapper and we kept studying and here we are right at the end. Amen. Rapture is the final good news. It's the ultimate good news. So don't let anybody ever tell you, oh, just preach the gospel. The good news is being like Christ, being one with him. That's the good news. Not judging through life down here. Yeah, it's good news to us now to know where we're going for sure. But the ultimate good news is up there. Um... Born again believer. I don't. I don't think I mentioned three days of darkness. Maybe I did, <clears throat> but a lot of people are on that. Listen, the three days of darkness was one of the plagues of Egypt, the ten plagues. So there will be darkness in Revelation sixteen when God pours out one of the vials. I don't know if there's going to be a three day darkness before the rapture. So it, it's not. There's nowhere in there that it, the timing of it is going to be for us. So, you know, people like the three days of darkness for whatever reason. I get that question a lot, believe it or not. So. <clears throat> the days are going to be cut short because God darkens the sun, moon, and the stars. That's in Revelation 8. And the reason they have to be cut short, Jesus said if they weren't cut short, then all flesh would die. So that reason is found in Revelation 7, 1. Amen. What's up, Brother Mike? Repo Man 64, praise God. So Revelation 7, 1, this, I'm telling you, this was one of my revelations, that angels hold back the wind. And when you Google what happens to the earth when there's no wind, it's extreme weather. We lose oxygen. So if God and the sun gets seven times hotter, which is Isaiah 30, 26. So God had to darken the sun, moon, and the stars or no flesh would be able to survive. So that, that's the bottom line of why they had to be shortened. But the seven years will hold up. The seven years will be seven years. Yes, God controls every drop of everything, as I like to say. All right, hold on. I got to let this nut out. Oh. And pray for no skunk in the yard. Look for them raptured. <clears throat> yeah, look, that's that's basically true. I mean, look, a lot of people say the book of Mark is for the sleepy church. <laughs> I don't even know what the sleepy church means. <laughs> I mean lukewarm church people they're not really saved they're going to go in the tribulation so do they go to the book of mark i mean the book of mark everything in the book of mark is basically in the book of matthew so matthew is basically to the jews luke was definitely written for the christian no doubt and john of course is universal telling everybody jesus is god almighty Look, look what he's done, you know. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So, you know, the book of John is just glorious. Listen, Chuck Missler had an idea that he thought John got off the island of Patmos. So he wrote the book of Re Revelation on the island of Patmos. 
And then after he got off, he went back to Ephesus. He thinks he wrote the Gospel of John last. And that's just an interesting thought. We have no way of knowing, but think about that. So that would make the Gospel of John almost the pinnacle of God's work. And look, you, you can't get any better than the Gospel of John. I mean, people rail against the Gospel of John. It's it's all in there. The love of God is all in there. Please address pets going to heaven. <laughs> is that Sister Mel from Clapper? <laughs> Listen, my... If if I had to choose a gun to my head, I would say pets are not being raptured. That's just it's hard to it's hard to make a case for pets being raptured. Can God do it? God can do anything. All things are possible with the Lord, but I don't know if pets are gonna be raptured. Listen, people people have all kinds of pets, lizards, snakes. Rats, horses. I mean, how are you gonna how are you gonna determine all that? Amen. And look at right. So it it's not that we don't read Matthew and say, oh, that's for the Jews. No, but it's basically the book to the Jews. So you just have to rightly divide it. You can still read it. Amen. I mean, after the fact, look, I, I tell my dogs, I say, you might be resurrected during the millennium when I come back down. <laughs> but it's, I don't know. It would be crazy if God raptured all our pets, if you really think about it. That would be nuts. He's already back at the door. Go on, boo. Hang out for a minute. Earthly enjoyment. There it is, sister. I mean, it's just, you know, maybe God's even counting on us to do a little bit of common sense. Like, uh, he gave us pets. We love them. They give us great joy, comfort, love, all of it. So he did that as a blessing. But, you know, to have them be raptured, I don't know. Yeah, and God God could do it. God can do anything. <laughs> he can do anything. I think it's Daniel 335. I haven't done that one in a while, but no one can stay the hand of God. <laughs> yeah, the pets. You probably get it a lot, though, too, don't you? <laughs> you get the pet question all the time. And look, listen, just to dip it, dip into the other end of it. It could, listen to me. It could be almost a sin that we're so attached to our pets while the world around us is crumbling and going to hell. So, you know what I mean? Like if you, if you've got an over, um, what's the word I'm looking for? An over infatuation of love for your pets. And I know we love pets. I know people don't want to hear that, but it could be, you know, if it's too much, it could almost be a sin type thing. So it's just my opinion. Idol, that's probably kind of what I was looking for. Idolish. <laughs> Pet obsession. Thank you. Our dead cat. <laughs> and look, those could be, yeah, just, I mean, look, God understands we love him, but we have to understand his word. Right? Like, you know, does it say a lot about pets? Do, do we witness to pets? I mean, I don't know. It's, <clears throat> look, I hope in the end somehow they come back, but. Look, it's Ecclesiastes. It says the soul of man goes up, the soul of the beast goes back to the earth. That could be the very verse that 
answers the whole question that pets don't go to heaven, they're for earth. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah, heaven will be, listen, what, once we're one with the Lord, we we may not even think about the pets. You got to consider that too. We're not going to think the same way. Once we're glorified, the fullness of God is flowing through us. Think about it. We're not going to think like we think now, you know, about our pets and, you know, stuff. So I, I don't know. It's the judge of the earth will do right. I think that's Genesis 19.25 or 25.19, one of those. God's going to make it all work out. Nobody's going to complain. Nobody's going to file a protest. It'll all work out perfectly. And we'll understand it. We'll agree with it. We'll be all for it. Amen. Praise God. All glory to God. Sister Jen, are you're not still in Vegas, are you? Is that still going on? Amen. We are here, brother. I believe we are here. Home now. Praise God you got through it. Amen. Amen. You sweated that trip out. Now you're home and ready for the rapture. Who are the remnant? That's a good question. That'll be a third of the Jews. I think it's Zechariah 13. He's going to save a third. Two thirds will worship Antichrist. So <clears throat> eight every night. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Born again. Amen. Yeah, pre pre flood, the atmosphere was different. Uh, Kent Hoven, believe it or not, he's his creation stuff. He's got a ton of good stuff on all that. What will heaven look like? No idea. It'll be glorious. Listen, we, we really don't know. Eye is not seen, ears not heard, mind is not perceived what God has prepared for those who love him. I mean, this is gonna blow us away. Anything we think we thought of down here, it's gonna be so, so far beyond that. Pets will be left behind so they can eat people. Revelation 6, 8, God's going to turn all the tame animals and part of the tribulation on the people. Yes, it's once saved, always saved. Ivory palaces, I like that. That's in Psalm 45. I didn't even dig that out. I must have been snoozing on that verse. All right, so take it easy. He's on the road. Kelly got raptured. <laughs> Amen. 100% for the bride of the Messiah. <laughs> Could you imagine us all being raptured and everybody's got a trail of animals behind them? <laughs> John fifteen six. Let's 
sounds like divine, divine stuff. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Well, if you don't abide in Christ, I don't know. John 15 is actually tricky. Some people say it's just talking about works, like rewards. And then other people try to make it into losing your salvation. So I would have to fully study that out. But now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So look, our works are tried by fire. So it could be works and it's burned and it's no good. And that's I, that's what I think most people think it means. Or if a man abide not in me, meaning he was never really saved. So again, 1 Corinthians 15, 2 says, if you believed in vain, then you're not saved. So the famous salvation scriptures, if you believe in vain with no effort, no purpose, no effect, that's what that word vain means. I mean, you, you could say you believe all day long, but it won't mean anything. And only God will know. The black cube and religions. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I don't watch a lot of stuff. Fake Christian, lukewarm, could be that. is not grafted in right where a real Christian is grafted in to the olive tree well 153 we'll see it's gonna listen people it's gonna get interesting quick we're almost to the bang zone God's gotta be doing stuff earthquakes are still ripping world's still on fire Evil governments are still doing their things. It's all crumbling. Look, digital money was supposed to be here by now, so I don't know what happened there. But I guess that's still coming. Oh, did did that summit get postponed to the 23rd? I didn't see that. Is that, did they announce that or something? Pray against the Hillary hurricane. <laughs> I know Brother Steve sent me that video. I thought it was a joke because <laughs> I didn't. I mean, it was a joke, but I, I didn't even know there was a hurricane coming named Hillary. Oh, okay. You're just saying that. Yeah, because they change those dates a lot. But listen, once we're raptured, Satan, all, all they'll all know. They'll all know and they'll get it going immediately. So all the regular scheduled stuff won't mean anything. It'll be COVID-19 times a million. So COVID shut down the world. What do you think the rapture is going to do? It It's going to shut down and they're going to rise up. And this is the new rules. We don't care if you like it. We don't care what you say. You can protest and we'll shoot you. They'll probably shoot protesters right on the spot. It'll be no no bull crap, no nonsense, and 
going right at it. Hey man, good night, brother Dale. Yeah, I'm almost done here, guys. I'm exhausted. Uh, listen, the next study probably won't be long Tuesday night, so we'll be able to hang out for extra on Tuesday night. Yeah, definitely wheels off, just full bore. Same age. Look, we won't even have an age. <laughs> Age will be out of the equation. Oh yeah, they'll they'll say aliens did it for sure. I did not see the evacuation drill there. Amen, Chi Chi, amen. God bless you. Man, 100 plus. Yeah, we haven't had any good weather here. We, we lost all the heat. You guys are getting all the heat. We're, we're not even getting it. I mean, if we get 80 degrees, it's a miracle. Yeah, it'll be quick. Amen, quicks and Sister Haley in the house. Yeah, the 1740, you remember that. Listen, remember the video was three hours, 1740, but then it changed to 45. So God let me see that 1740. It, it had to be because now if you look at that video, it's 45 on the end. That that was huge. Hug your neck. <laughs> Amen. You remember the 1740. I love it. Oh, God has blessed us so much. It's incredible. Incredible what he's done. On the big screen, uh-oh. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Yeah, we got to go before October 11th. If we're here October 11th, we're going to have a lot of nervous folks. <laughs> God's timing is perfect, no doubt about it. And that's the thing. Listen, I clicked in. I used to get depressed after high watch days, truly. Like, ugh, just thinking, I don't have any other scenarios. What happened? Why didn't we go? You know, the depression of it. Then something clicked in. Every time a high watch day would come and go after that, I just felt it like a challenge. Like, we didn't go, which means... We didn't figure it out yet. So it was different. Like, okay, we're still here. We've missed something. Go back to this. Go back to this. Figure this out. It, it just turned around for me. Like, the depression was gone. It, it really was different than the other high watch days. So that's the best I can explain it. But praise God. And listen, all the high watch days... We never had the barren women story. We never had the barren women. All of a sudden, this barren women thing makes perfect sense. We're like Isaac, the son of promise, children of promise, matched up with the New Testament. It, it was perfect. So praise God, it absolutely was a treasure hunt and God gave it to us. So, and listen, that came with what? at the appointed time in the time of life. That's not necessarily a date. That's a time frame. So even that part of it was cool if you think about it. So God gave us the little window, appointed time, time of life. Now we added summer fruit to it. We've added a Lule 25, which is 9-11. It's all culminating to this. So this is gonna be amazing. No, we don't, Nick. I, I don't. Look, at, you know what? Ultimately, it came from the fact that when I went to bed that night, I said, why did Isaac's birth have to be an appointed time? That was the original thought. So that morphed into because Sarah was barren. So I don't know. So the, the, the thought that got me on the whole barren, I don't know. But. That was the original thought. Like I said, Lord, you called Abraham at 75, 
25 years you made him wait. He's on his face laughing. I'm 100 years old, Lord, what's going on? It didn't make any sense that he would have to be born at an appointed time. That didn't make any sense. He could have been born any time. And then I looked at Rebecca. Oh, that's probably what it was. That could have been it. Because then I, that's what it was. I looked up the other births to see if there were appointed times or anything significant to when they were born. Joseph didn't have anything. It just said he was born. Jacob and Esau just said he was born. Samson was just born. Samuel was just born. And then we got to the Shunammite woman, appointed time, time of life. That's probably how it happened. Praise God, brother, you pulled it out of me. <laughs> Lord, thank you. I think that was the process because I looked at the other births. I was like, wait a second, do they have a significant birth? So yeah, I think it all came from the that original time. I'm telling you, it was two in the morning. I'm I'm whooped. I'm not, you know, I do think about it quite a bit, but sometimes I don't. And it and I thought, why did Isaac's God must put that thought in my head, because I didn't even think it. I'm thinking, why does his birth have to be an appointed time? That doesn't even make any sense. He's the first one. God's doing a long line. Two thousand years later, Messiah would come through that line, the ultimate son of promise. So 2,000 years, the first guy, the first baby has to be appointed a Moed, a literal Moed. So that was amazing. Oh, God is so good. And again, if we were raptured on any of those other dates, we wouldn't even have known any of that. Isaiah David, love it, love it. Isaac, love the old school Bible names. All right, you guys, I'm gonna call it a night. All glory to God. Man, I, ho I actually hope that study was good. I really do. I'm not just saying that so you guys say it was good. I don't want you to say that. I wanted it to be good, just meaning you really seen it. You really seen it in God's brilliance. He put in there, they assembled together. The United Nations assembled together and they made a decision. Let's let them have a homeland. People opposed it. God brought them through all the red tape and made it happen. I'm telling you, please watch those documentaries. Look up the 1948 State of Israel being born. Tons of stuff on YouTube about it. It's uh, it's just awesome. It'll you'll glorify God. You'll praise God through it because it is amazing. Thank you for saying that. And I, I wasn't fishing for compliments. Please know that. I just wanted to come out right. So, all right, next one's Tuesday night, 8 o'clock. I'll try to sneak in a video before that, maybe maybe the parable of the ten virgins, even though I spit it all out tonight. <laughs> but we'll dig, I'll see if I can dig it out and go from there. But uh, all right, we'll pray it out. Heavenly Father, we love you with our whole heart, mind, soul, spirit, strength, everything inside of us, we love you. We are so thankful that you opened our eyes and saved our souls. We lift up our families, Lord, the ones that are on the fence, the ones that don't seem to be saved at all. Please, Lord, bring them in. We lift up our kids, our parents, our siblings, our loved ones, our friends, people we've witnessed to, Lord. Please save them. And if it's not your will, save them in the tribulation. We will trust you for their very souls, Lord. We lift them up, put them in your hands. And Lord, I just lift up Brother Greg and all the people like Brother Greg that are going through horrible things, health crisis issues, family health crisis issues, Lord. 
Lift him up and everybody that needs prayer right now, Father. We are your children. We're trying to get to the finish line. We see the finish line. Please, Lord, strengthen us. Give us miracles in these last days that we can get there in all glory to you. We will praise you and thank you. We cannot wait to be standing before your throne in heaven praising you on our faces, Lord. It is going to be incredible. We are truly thankful and humbled what you've done for us. I thank you for this study tonight. I love your word, Lord. I don't think it came out perfect, Lord, but all glory to you. We love you. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you. Jesus, we love you and thank you. You did it all. You did your Father's will, came down and perfectly fulfilled it. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for sealing us, leading us into all truth. We love you, praise you, thank you. We lift up these prayers in the mighty name of the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. With one mind, one accord, we all agree that we want to be with you soon, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, praise God, peeps, praise God. I will see you Tuesday, and we'll get it done. We'll do another live. We'll do the Psalms of Ascent. So look, you can pre-read those Psalms, right? Pre-read the Psalms 120 to 134, and we will trudge through another day, getting closer to the end. Brother Steve, Brother Nick, Thanks for moderating. Appreciate that. And thank you, everybody, for hanging out. God bless. I will see you on the next one.